Kia ora koutou and good morning everybody and welcome to hearing 21A, um, which is the topic of significant natural areas. Um, just very briefly, I'd, I'd like to do just a few things. I note that we've got quite a number of um, lay submitters and by lay submitters, I mean individuals and individual families and those sorts of things. So just want to say a little bit about the process that we follow today before we start. The first one is a very general housekeeping one, and I see that everyone's pretty much doing it already. But if you're not speaking and you're just observing at, at a particular point in the hearing, if you could turn your video off and mute your sound, please, because in that way, um, it just keeps the, the pictures clear and keeps the bandwidth available for those people that are actually presenting and, and speaking. Um, the second point is, is that today's Zoom session is broken up into two different parts. There's a morning session and an afternoon session. And when you're in the, if you're in the afternoon session or want to watch the afternoon session, you'll need to log on to a separate meeting request. Um, so th this morning until lunchtime, we'll be on the call that we're on now, and there'll be a separate one of those for this afternoon. When we break for morning tea this morning, uh, which we will at some point, we'll, we'll hopefully remind people at the time, but if we don't, please don't uh, log off. Please just simply mute your sound, turn your screen off, go to, and get your cup of tea or whatever it is you plan to do. And then when we kick off again, it's just a matter of um, sitting back down and we, and we take off again. Um, a couple of other things regarding uh, procedures for today. And, and the, the first one is that we have read uh, all the evidence that's been provided to us where parties haven't presented evidence and are simply speaking to their previous submissions or further submissions. We've read those as well. That's the reason why we are limiting people to presenting a 10 minute summary of what it is, their, their issue is, and, and equally importantly, what they want us to do about it. Uh, it's not necessary and it's not helpful for people to be reading out vast chunks of material that we've already read and are familiar with. So we're very keen for you to present your information in a very focused way that's focusing on what the problem is and what it is you want us to do about it. And if you want to, us to refer to a particular part of your evidence, then point us to it, but you don't need to read it out word for word for word for word. Um, I should also say that um, the Section 42A report is a, is a very big document. And even though we limit the submitters to a 10 minute summary, we don't put that same restriction on the council. And that's simply because individual submitters are dealing with their own particular issue. The Section 42A authors have to, have to respond to everything. So it follows that they need a little bit more time. But in the same way, um, Ms. Chibnall's been at quite a few of these hearings now and is, is, is pretty proficient in sticking to the, the key points and um, helping us in that regard. But I should say too that the Section 42A report is simply a recommendation from the council team. Um, it doesn't carry any more weight of itself than anything anybody else is going to tell us during the course of the day. So just because um, Ms. Chibnall and Mr. Turner have made a recommendation that says your sub individual submissions either are or aren't accepted. That doesn't mean to say that that matter's been decided. That's what this hearing is all about, is to actually hear all points of view so that we can make an informed, uh, an informed decision. Uh, the second to final thing I want to say before I introduce the panel and ask other people to introduce themselves is that but for those of you that aren't um, frequent users of, of, or frequent attendees of hearings, please try not to be intimidated either by the technology or by uh, the formality that you may sense in, in, the, in this. We are simply here to hear what you've got to tell us. 
if we don't understand something or there's something that we'd like clarified, we'll ask you to do that. Um, but you shouldn't feel in some way that you're, you know, in the in the frame or under the spotlight or whatever else. We're just very keen to hear what you've got to say in, in your own words and in your own time. Um, so please try and be as um, as relaxed as you can be, given that you may be in unfamiliar unfamiliar territory. The final introductory thing I want to say is that um, the resource management world is somewhat of a small one. And that means that various of the commissioners have various relationships with various other people through the course of their daily lives and other work. And that's why the panel has prepared a register of interests that's published on the council website. And that identifies what those relationships are. And in some cases, why some of us won't hear submissions of certain parties because of the relationship that we have with them. We won't belabor that uh, too much, but at the appropriate time when the appropriate submitter uh, appears, and if one of us has uh, a relationship with them, we'll declare that and that particular uh, commissioner won't take any part in hearing that submission or in making decisions on it. And I just wanna make that point pretty clearly. And in my own case, that relates to the submissions of both Genesis Energy and Bathurst Resources, both of whom are appearing today, but I'll address that specifically at the time that they appear and the other commissioners will do that um, if there's any issues in relation to them personally. So I think without, without further ado, I'll ask the panel members please to briefly introduce themselves. I'll then ask for the people that are on the call to briefly introduce themselves just so that we know who's in the, who's in the room. And if you're just simply a uh, an observer because this hearing is public, the link to this um, meeting is publicly available. So there may just be people that are that are here to watch, that's fine too, but we would just ask that you introduce yourself so we know who is here, please. So I'll start with perhaps the panel and um, then we'll go around the rest of the room, thanks. Morena well, Koto, my name is Will Marg, Independent Commissioner. Thanks, Mr. Marg. Paul Cooney, uh, Deputy Chair of the Hearings Panel, Lua from Tauranga. Thanks, yes, Mr. Kenny. Janet, yeah, Janet Gibb, um, a councillor, but appointed to this um, hearing as independent. And I'm Janet right. Sedgwick, and I'm an independent commissioner. Thank you, Ms. Sedgwick. Um, perhaps we just start with the council folk that are here, um, and then we'll go around the room for the, the various submitters that are here, please. You're on mute, Ms. Chibnall. Okay. You go. There you go. Good morning. Susan Chibnall, um, uh, Policy Planner in the Resource Management Team, and also with me today is Bridget Parham, who's the Legal Counsel from um, the Board Council of Tompkin Wake. Thanks, Ms. Chibnall. <laughs> Good morning, uh, John Turner, WSP. I'm the ecology stock team for the, the council. Thanks, Mr. Turner. And you've contributed to the Section 42A report alongside um, Ms. Chibnall. That's correct, yes. Thank you. Morning, folk. My name's Will Gauntlet, um, District Plan Manager here at the Waikato District Council. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Gauntlet. Morning, all. Um, my name is Fletcher Bell, and I'm the District Plan Administrator for the Waikato District Council. Morena, I'm Carolyn Red, um, a policy planner in the Waikato District Council. Thanks, Ms. Red. Hi, I am Anton Murray in the Geospatial Department, mainly here as an observer, but available for questions or answers on the technical Thank details. Thank you very much. Morena, I'm Jim Evenhoe, Planning and Policy Manager at Waikato District Council, observing. Thanks, today. Thanks Mr. Evenhoe. Good morning, everyone. My name is Suki Singh, and I'm a consultant planner to the panel. Thank you, Ms. Singh. I think that's the council team. Um, let's see who else is in the room, please. If you could just quickly introduce yourselves, that would be helpful. Kota Tato. Um, I'm the Fee Foley from Waikato Regional Council. I'll be presenting planning evidence. I have with me 
Dr. Yan Linden, who will be presenting evidence, and also in support, we've got um, Dr. Paul Dutton. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Foley and team. Uh, Angeline Greensill, Tainui or Tainui. I'm more here on a watching brief for the matters that will be discussed with Karioi Native Reserve. I won't be listening to everything this morning. I have other engagements, but I will be here this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Greensill. Good, Angeline. Good morning, I'm Hilary Walker. I'm a Regional Policy Advisor for Federated Farmers. Um, just observing for this early part, we're, we're presenting late this afternoon. Oh, sorry, late this morning. Late this morning, I think, yes. Yeah, and, um, and we'll have two farmer representatives with us at that time. All right, thank you, Ms Walker. Good morning, it's Pauline Whitney here, um, Consultant Planner for Transpower. Um, I'm also on this afternoon, so I'll just be observing throughout the day. Thank, thank you, you, Ms Whitney. Morning, commissioners and parties. Kelsey Barry here. I'm observing the council this morning and this afternoon. My colleague Joshua Leckie will be appearing with Bath Bathurst Resources Limited and BT Mining. Thank you, Ms. Barry. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Good morning, it's Sarah Nien here from the surveying company. Thank you, Ms Nien, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Brian Button. I'm a submitter for Kiana Lace and I'm here observing. Thank you, Mr Button. Uh, morning. Can you, uh, yeah, yes, uh, we can hear you, thanks, Mr Denton. Morning, my name's Terence. Um, I have a submission um, hearing on Tuesday next week, but I have an interest in the uh, uh, Department of Conservation's uh, presentation this morning. So just observing today. Thanks, Mr. Denton, and welcome. Thank you. Hi there, um, Mark Kangnickel here from WSP, uh, senior ecologist. I'm just here observing this morning as well for a short time. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Catherine Overwater, Waikato District Council, and I'm just observing today. Thanks, Ms. Overwater. Morning, Robbie, Robbie Bennett, uh, just a land owner with an SNA. I'm just here to observe today. Thanks, Mr. Bennett. Welcome. We've got Mr. Tate. Would you like to just briefly introduce yourself, please? We can hear you. That's fine, Mr. Yeah, Mr. I'm, Tate. Yeah, I'm just here to represent myself on two properties that I own. One at 72 James Road, Huntley, and the other property at 185B Hekramata Road, Narrowa Hill. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tate. I think we've got Ms. Tregida, if I'm not mistaken, even though the screen just says Jean. I'm surmising that that's Ms. Tregida, who we've heard from in a previous hearing, but the person with Jean on their name tag can confirm that for us, please. Or not, as the case may be. All right, I think that's everybody. And if, it, if if other people join during the course of the morning, then so be it. So I think we'll make a we'll make a start on the on the substantive matters uh, today, um, and we'll start with Ms. Chibnall and Mr. Turner, please. And and I think we should say at the outset we certainly appreciate that this has been a bit of a uh, a mammoth task getting to where you've got, and we're we're grateful for the for the time and effort that you've put into trying to reconcile uh, you know a number of, of different views so we're grateful for that bearing in mind the point I made before is that um, Ms Chibnall's 
uh, report and Mr. Turner's input are recommendations to us that we will um, accept or otherwise, depending on how everything pans out after the hearing's concluded. So thanks, Ms. Chibnall, just when you're ready, thank you. All right, thank you for that. Um, so good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Susan Chibnall, and I am the Section 42A Reporting Officer for the Natural Environment, Indigenous Vegetation and Habitats topic. I'm also the author of the rebuttal evidence in relation to the topic. I wish to introduce Mr. John Turner from WSP, a technical expert on ecology, and is here today to answer any questions the panel may have in his capacity as Council's ecological expert. While I do not intend to cover my recommendations in detail, my opening statement will provide a broad overview of the legislative framework for Indigenous biodiversity, the spatial data for significant natural areas, the objectives and the associated policies and rules in relation to significant natural areas, SNAs, overview of the submissions and themes, main changes from recommended from the notified version, amendments from the sub submitter evidence and matters still in contention. Um, and for um, legislative framework and Indigenous biodiversity in, in paragraph four, can I take that as set out as read? In my yes, thank you. Yes, no, that's fine. Right. We'll begin by outlining the purpose, structure and content of the Act of the Natural Environment, which contains the objectives and policies relevant to this topic. Chapter 3 also contains objectives and policies for outstanding landscapes, significant amenity landscapes and natural character. However, submissions in this regard have been addressed in Hearing 22. As notified, Chapter 3 has one overarching objective for Indigenous biodiversity and a suite of policies to support it. This objective is a general approach for all Indigenous vegetation and seeks to ensure the biodiversity and ecosystems are maintained or enhanced, which aligns with the policy direction in the Regional Policy Statement. The supporting policies include considerations for Indigenous biodiversity when undertaking activities. There is a second objective, which is specific to SNAs and seeks to protect and enhance Indigenous biodiversity within SNAs. The supporting policy set out the management approach to Indigenous biodiversity. The proposed district plan maps contain a spatial layer that indicates where SNAs are located in the district. The rule framework is designed to apply to the identified SNAs with a more restrictive approach as imposed within the spatial overlay and a less restrictive regime outside the spatial overlay. The criteria for identifying SNAs are located in Appendix 2 criteria for determining significance of Indigenous biodiversity. The rules for Indigenous biodiversity are set out in zone chapters. The rules manage the following activities within SNAs. Earthworks, vegetation clearance, subdivision, which incentivizes the protection of SNA by the allowance of additional lots, and subdivision that divides an SNA. There are rules applying to indigenous vegetation outside an SNA to cover vegetation clearance for the rural zone and country living zone. The rule permits unlimited vegetation clearance for specific purposes, for example, removing vegetation that endangers human life or existing buildings or structures or limited amounts of clearance for other reasons such as maintaining productive pasture or creating a building platform. So an overview of the submissions. There are 623 primary submission points addressed that relate to the Indigenous vegetation and habitat and 674 further submissions. 31 pieces of evidence were received and that includes all the rebuttal evidence. The common themes are the accuracy of the SNA mapping, objectives and policies and the application of policies managing the hierarchy of effects, including offsetting and environmental compensation. The management of manuka and kanuka and their recent classification of being either at risk or threatened, land use effects regarding earthworks and vegetation clearance, the recognition of farming activities. Responsibility of kauri dieback and the management of ind indigenous fat. The main changes recommended from the notified version are the mapping of SNAs. There's been much discussion within the evidence on the mapping of SNAs. Through my consideration of the submissions and site visits to submitters' properties, I became aware of a high level of inaccuracy of the data informing the mapping of these sites. 
I've outlined some options to address the inaccuracies of the mapping in my section 42 report. My recommended position is to remove the mapping of SNAs from the proposed planning maps until such time as ground truthing has been undertaken, but retaining the mapping for those properties that have been ground truthed or <clears throat> have been subjected to an extensive and detailed ecological assessment as part of the statutory process. For example, the notice of requirement for the Huntley Bypass, or they're in ownership of a government organisation such as Department of Conservation, or are protected by a Queen Elizabeth Trust covenant. As a result of this recommendation, it has necessitated amendments to the definition for significant natural areas, so that the SNA provisions apply to every piece of Indigenous vegetation that meets the criteria contained in Appendix 2, or those areas mapped, such as on the planning maps. This is a similar approach to the Operative District Plan, and it has also necessitated amendments to Policy 3.3.2 regarding the identification of SNAs. The up-and-coming National Policy Statement for Biodiversity is likely to require all territorial councils to undertake a district-wide assessment to determine if an area is significant against criteria contained in the National Policy Statement and suitably identify it. This assessment must be undertaken within five years after the commencement date. As a process subsequent to the Schedule 1 process associated with the proposed plan, I recommend that the Council promulgate a series of plan changes specific to each geographical area to reintroduce the full mapping concept back into the district plan accurately and delete the application of the general SNA criteria from each geographical area to each plan change. Mr Turner and I undertook site visits to 40 properties in response to submissions and all of these resulted in recommended changes to the mapped SNA for those properties. I have recommended three further amendments to the SNA mapping as a result of the submitted evidence. So um, non-regulatory support. And a number of landowners, particularly in the farming community, express concern that they are taking care of SNAs on behalf of the district with very little assistance or recognition. I recommend including a new non-regulatory policy which will facilitate council to work with landowners to assist with the management of SNAs. This policy also offers ecological assistance to determine whether an area of vegetation qualifies as an SNA or not, and facilitate collaboration between landowners and both district and regional councils. In regard to the management hierarchy, I have recommended policy amendments to make the hierarchy of management approaches clearer and to recognise where offsetting and environmental compensation feature in that hierarchy. I have recommended additional policies regarding management hierarchy and biodiversity offsetting to apply to a more general indigenous vegetation to mirror those policies applying to SNAs. I have recommended amendments to policy 3.2.3, .3, management hierarchy, to recognise and protect the values of Indigenous biodiversity and to clarify that avoiding adverse effects is preferable in the first instance. I recommended an additional clause in policy 3.2.4, biodiversity offsetting, to avoid adverse effects to the extent practicable, and a new clause to recognise there are limits to the appropriate use of biodiversity offsetting, as this will better reflect the, the regional policy statement. I've also recommended including new definitions for biodiversity offsetting and environmental compensation to, to provide additional clarity. Um, in terms of the existing infrastructure and functional requirement, I have included recognition of existing infrastructure in policy 3.2.6 in terms of maintenance, operation and op upgrading. I recommended an additional new policy to recognise that activities may have a locational or functional requirement to locate within an SNA where there is no alternative location, as there appears the proposed plan does not address this aspect of the RPS. Earthworks rules. <clears throat> I have recommended removing the limits on volume and area for earthworks when managing existing tracks, fences, etc. as this farming in infrastructure already exists. I've also recommended including an advice note in response to the submission from Waikato Regional Council, drawing attention to the Waikato Pest Management Plan. I recommend an inclusion of conservation activities when undertaking earthworks within an SNA to recognise that earthworks may be required to facilitate conservation activities that can benefit an SNA. So that brings me to the vegetation clearance rules. 
Policy 11 of the coastal, New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement sets out a management hierarchy where adverse effects of activities are avoided on a particular taxa and habitats, most of which appear in the criteria for SNAs. This absolute policy direction of the NZCPS has necessitated changes to rules to separate SNAs in the coastal environment from SNAs outside the coastal environment, with more restrictive rules applying to SNAs within the coastal environment. It also became apparent that the rules did not explicitly allow for simple and logical activities such as clearance of non-Indigenous species in an SNA and vegetation clearance outside an SNA, particularly relevant to the urban zone. I have also recommended vegetation clearance associated with conservation activities, relying on the existing definition of this term as a permitted activity within an SNA. On the matter of kauri dieback, the Environment Court decision arising from Thames Coromandel District Council's district plan held it as a function of a territorial authority to manage the control of Karadaibe to maintain Indigenous biological diversity. I've recommended a simplistic approach to the management of Karadaibe where I have recognised the disease via a broad approach and a policy. To support the policy, I have recommended straightforward rules where no earthworks can be within the Kauri root zone and a matter of discretion if the permitted standards are exceeded. The reason for this simplistic approach is that I consider it would be more effective and efficient and practical than the more complex approach sought by the Department of Conservation. On Manuka and Kanaka, I have recommended relocating the rules, enabling the removal of Kanaka and Manuka for maintenance of pasture from outside an SNA to inside an SNA. This approach is in response to the recent classification as either being at risk or threatened, which has meant that this species instantly, instantly meets the criteria for being an SNA. On the matter of bats, I'm aware that my rebuttal has referred to the management of long-tailed bats rather than the management of the habitat. Nevertheless, I have not recommended including provisions for the management of the habitats of bats due to insufficient data, both inside and out, Side and SNA. In addition, I consider the lack of expertise within Council and the practicality of being able to implement submitter's suggested approach to manage this issue means that the framework sought by Department of Conservation will not be effective nor efficient. So, uh, now, the main matters from submitter evidence that remain in contention, the significant natural area mapping. Waikato Regional Council have not supported the removal of the majority of the SNA mapping. I've not been persuaded by Ms. Foley to change my thinking on this, although I essentially agree that the mapping of these areas provides clarity and certainty for both landowners and the council. I consider this needs to be absolutely accurate and informed by robust data. On the matter of objectives and policies, Department of Conservation in their original submission supported the retention of Objective 3.1.1, However, Mr. Riddell sought an amendment to Objective 3.1.1 to include additional wording, attributes and functioning. I consider the additional wording does not add any significant benefit. Um, Federated Farmers New Zealand requested to include additional wording to Objective 3.2.1 to provide for protection and enhancement through regulatory and non-regulatory methods. I've not been persuaded by the evidence and consider that non-regulatory methods are best separate to the rules as they are not conducive to a rule framework. The retention of policy 3.2.2 identified and recognised was sought by Federated Farmers, Waikato Regional Council and Department of Conservation. Due to my recommended approach to the mapping, I am still of the opinion that the deleting of this policy is appropriate as the policy does not add any real value. The Department of Conservation considers there should be no permitted activity for building development in policy 3.2.6, which provides for vegetation clearance. I have not been persuaded by the department's evidence and consider that the proposed plan needs to provide for people to develop their land in a sustainable manner. Ms Foley, on behalf of Waikato Regional Council, has sought to amend policy 3.2.6, which provides for the vegetation clearance, to recognise that only clearance with minor effects will be enabled. I am still of the opinion that as there are other policies that establish the hierarchy of effects, this amendment is not necessary. The policy's purpose is generic and simply relates to the specified activities that are considered appropriate. 
This finally requested the location of policy 3.2.6 to be located under 3.1.2 so that it is clear that clearance applies to all Indigenous vegetation. I have not agreed with this approach as it has an unintended consequence of limiting Indigenous vegetation removal outside ECNAs, even for gardening. Definitions. The recommended recommendation to amend the definition for the significant natural area has caused concerns for several submitters. I have recommended to include additional wording that will mean an SNA will be an area that is either mapped or meets one or more of the criteria in Appendix 2. I have not changed my thinking on this. This approach combined with a policy that provides for the cost of an ecological assessment covered by Council, in my view, is a reasonable solution until such time a more accurate spatial data is created. Ms Wolf, on behalf of Horticulture New Zealand, sought to amend the de definition for Indigenous vegetation to include reference to biosecurity work. I have not been persuaded by evidence as I consider the additional clause providing for conservation activities within earthworks rules and vegetation clearance rules alleviates their concerns. Mr Riddell, on behalf of the Department of Conservation, sought additional wording to the definition Indigenous vegetation to recognise long-tailed bat bats. I have rejected this on the grounds that this request is not supported by robust data and the rules sought are impractical to implement. Land use activities. <clears throat> Hill Country Farmers Group considered the earthworks rule for the maintenance of existing tracks, fences, drains, etc., to be redundant, as this is covered by a permitted activity for ancillary earthworks. But uh, as ancillary earthworks cover new tracks, I am still of the opinion that if a new track are needed within an SNA, this needs to be considered through a consenting process. Ms. Wolf, on behalf of Horticultural New Zealand, sought to include biosecurity works within the earthworks rule. I have not been persuaded by the evidence provided for this, as I believe the additional clause allowing for conservation activities will provide for biosecurity works to be undertaken. Although I've invited Ms. Wolf to clarify her concerns with case studies at the hearing. Evidence from Kim Robinson on behalf of Lockyer Farm saw additional wording repairing or reinstating to the vegetation clearance rule with regards to tracks. I've not agreed as I believe maintenance already covers repairing and that reinstating may go outside the realm of maintenance depending on the age of the track and the period of this use. Evidence from Mr Blumfield on behalf of Dilworth Trust sought amendments to the vegetation clearance rules to provide for remediation or stabilisation of the banks of a stream. I have not been persuaded by the evidence provided and suggest the land use consent document and the conditions provided by, Mr. Um, by Dilworth would prevent them from undertaking vegetation removal. Mr Riddell and Mr Bocomp of on behalf of Department of Conservation sought to include a more comprehensive approach within the earthworks rule to manage cardio dieback. Although I acknowledge this is a serious issue, I have not agreed with their approach because I consider the implementation of such would not be an effective mechanism to manage this disease. Evidence provided by Ms Turley on behalf of Department of Conservation sought to include provision for the management of long-tailed bats. Although I agree that the loss of roost sites for the species is an issue, I have not been persuaded to change my mind for reasons that I've outlined above. In summary, I'm mindful that my Section 42A report and analysis of submissions has taken a highly practical approach in terms of implementation of provisions. It can be difficult to balance legislative requirements with the eventual manifestation of a rule framework. And I have been mindful in my consideration of submissions of the question, how will this work on the ground? So in closing, I look forward to the evidence presented by submitters over the course of the hearing and welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms Chibnall. Is there anything that um, you need Mr Turner to um, address for us or, or is it, are you happy that... Um, his input will come in response to any questions that we may have. Yeah, I think that um, I think John will just add, answer questions as they they arise. Okay, no, that's fine. Well, let's see how we go with with questions for you then. Um, can we start with you, please, Ms. Gibb? Um, thank you, Ms. Chimnall. A really comprehensive report, and um, I don't have any questions at this stage. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Gibb. Uh, Ms. Sedgwick? Oh, no, I don't have any questions. I have um, a number of a number of thoughts, but I'm sure, <clears throat> pardon me, they're going to be teased out. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mark? Uh, look, thank you, Ms. Shibnall, and equally, Mr. Turner, for, for what you've provided. Uh, your summary is comprehensive, but I was just wondering, if, just going back to the summary and the options that you have provided us uh, from one to five, did you want to elaborate a little bit more on perhaps those for us? Uh, the, the, the options for the mapping? Uh, yes, yes, sorry, I should have said mapping. Have I got there and that's there in paragraph 59 of your of your um i think it's the objectives and policies yes um yeah the objectives and policies 42a report paragraph 59 i can put it on the screen here if you if that helps I've got some here. So um, well, I might put them on the screen anyway, so that other people that may not have your report can um, can see the context of them. Could I um, just make sure, Mr. Bell, that I can share my screen? Should have access now, please. Thank you. If someone could just let me know that that's um, yeah, it's there. There. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Here we go. Yes, right, I have them. Um, so what was that question again, please? Well, I just thought it might be useful to elaborate on the five options that you provided in relationship to the mapping. Right, the okay. That you'd come to. Um, okay, well, I guess option one is just it's status quo, remain, uh, keep the SNA layer map as it is on, on, the, map, on, the, on the notified maps. Um, subject to the um, site um, amendments to the site visits that we've already undertaken. Um, option two is to retain the, remap the mapping for, as an information layer only um, with e either inside or outside the proposed plan. Um, and um, the, the information layer won't, will not, would not trigger the rules. Um, Option three is that the SNAs are not mapped in the district plan and the rules do not refer to a map layer instead apply to all areas which meet the criteria. Uh, option four, um, retain the map sites um, where council is certain of the, of the extent and quality of the vegetation and delete all other sites that, haven't, that we're not sure of. And um, that would mean that only the 40 sites would be mapped based on our, our site visits and a series of plan changes. Um, the idea was to have a, uh, maybe find a, hi a, a hierarchy of geological uh, areas that would be, we'd focus on first, like you could put like perhaps the Bonga Coast first and as an area that's of most, you know, higher risk maybe, or um, some of the whole country areas second and just do groups of geological areas and, and focus on those, um, getting those areas mapped accurately. Option five is, which is what we um, I landed on, is that it's a combination of three and four, which is to retain the mapped sites where we know for certain that they're accurate and delete all the other sites from the planning maps and amend the provisions to apply to every piece of indigenous vegetation that meets the criteria. And then a series of plan change would have to happen as we um, ground truth our way through the district. I think that's, yep. does that answer your? Yes, yes. I guess if we look at option five, how long do you think that would take to make, to give effect to what you're saying? How, how much time is required? Um, quite a lot of time. It's been mm. quite significant. Look, and to give you uh, an idea, I think um, John might be able to correct me here. I think the 40 that we did, I think that took us about three months to do. And in saying that, that some of these sites, especially the Tamahiri Gully system, were relatively quick because they were, um, it was a gully system. But when you move out into 
um, the farming community and some of these SNA areas are quite substantial, they're quite large. It could take it could take several days to do one site visit. Mm -hmm. There's potential yeah. for that to happen. So it's a little bit, it depends <laughs> on, um, it does depend on the site and the size of the SNA. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mark. Mr. Kearney? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and I echo um, the um, comments made by the other panel. I, I thought your report was very good. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with uh, everything in it, but I, I think you're faced with a problem and you've tried to deal with it and, and also the way you've set things out. So, so it's, uh, it's quite easy to follow. So thanks for that. Um, but uh, if we just step back a little bit, um, the Waikato Regional Policy Statement says, I think policy 11.2 says that the um, Regional Council will identify areas of significant Indigenous vegetation and habitats at a, at a regional scale. And what they've done, this is what I'm surmising, they've, um, they've gone and identified uh, the areas that, that you have taken out, taken from the regional council and put into the district plan. Is that, is that right? Yes. yes. Were, those, were those areas that were a 600 and something um, sites that were put in the notified plan. Were they actually were they notified in the regional policy statement, or were they done subsequent to the regional policy statement? I um, do. I don't have the answer to that. Um, I think that they. No, I don't think they would have formed part of the regional policy statement. No, no. they don't get down near that to that level of. No. Um, I think the yeah the the requirement was that they would do the, the spatial data, provide us with the spatial data. Yeah, and I, that's how I read it. But maybe we can get that clarified during from from Waikato well, when they maybe can. maybe Ms Foley can just clarify that for yeah, us okay. now, Mr Kearney, yeah. if, if you're That'd still there, um, Ms Foley, is that right that the mapping followed the RPS, not the other way around? Um, yes, the well the mapping process for this started in 2012. Um, and the, so the, the RPS became operative in 2016, um, but obviously was being worked on through that process. But I believe that what was in the RPS was, is not too dissimilar to the previous RPS in terms of um, the SNA criteria. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the criteria are in the RPS, but the, but yes. the maps themselves the mapping's, no, are the mapping separate. No, mapping is separate, yes. Yeah, okay, the process, thank you. The process to get to the mapping is in, and what needs to happen with it is in the yes. RPS, but the mapping itself isn't. Okay, thank you. So, so the mapping started in 2012, did it? And then when was it finished? But can I answer this question? Um, yep, Yang then Dr. Yes. Deng will um, assist with that. Yep, thank you. So the, the mapping started in 2012, at uh, the first stage finished in uh, around 2017 uh, to 2018. Uh, so between that, they have some uh, the consultation with the district council and ground truthing. So this is the first stage of SNA. So from 2020, there are more 40 side with Mr. Turner has been ground truth. So yeah, I don't want to get into. A yeah, we don't. We don't need, that's fine. We we just want to get that understood at a at a at a high level and just what followed what. And I think we understand that now. So thanks, thanks both. So. So the, the, the information there was gathered and it's been, it's been in the regional council um, uh, possession since around about the end of 2018. That's what I gather from what um, um, the, the previous speaker said. Um, and I, I, I will be interested and I will be asking the regional council why they didn't go out and ground truth this themselves to make it more accurate. But um, you, you really just said, well, okay, I know there's a qualification in the regional policy statement to say, uh, check, check this out. 
but um, it seems just reading the material that we've been presented with that um, what you got on these sites was a high degree of inaccuracy. I think that was the description of Mr. Turner um, and that there were buildings, gardens, pasture and exotic plant species. Is that, is that, a, is that what, I know the regional council got a different view, but is that what you found? And perhaps Mr. Turner could comment on that. Yeah, the, it was, it, there's, a, there's a wide range of, of, of um, things on, on the different sites, uh, from sites that were completely um, pasture and, and we removed those completely, they were people's gardens. Some of the sites, there was only small adjustments to be made. Some, some were accurate. There, were about, there was about 20, about 25% were, were, were accurate, mainly around the Tamahiri gullies. But the rest, had, we had to make adjustments. In some cases, we had to remove the, 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 the entire uh, site from uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the map. Uh, in other cases, we just made small adjustments. But it was quite a bit, definitely, it's fair to say that in a lot of cases, it was very inaccurate, uh, uh, certainly for individual property owners. It may not be in the context of an overall SNA, which may extend well beyond the boundaries of the property. Um, and therefore, you've got some mapping that's come into a property, but it may well take out the most of their uh, most of the garden, for example. Is yeah. that is that to uh, make sense? Yeah, no, it, it is. Um, are you able to sort of put a, a percentage on the other way and say, well, um, how much of of what 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 you found really had no relationship whatsoever to SNA? Um, I'll just check my, I've, I've got the tail in my, my evidence there, and I think, uh, oh no, that's not the... You, you see, you say 25% were accurate, and I, I'm coming from the other end. How, 25% how were accurate, I think 25% approximately we removed in its uh, um, entirety, and about the rest, the 50% were adjustments made to to the um, to the boundaries. Okay. okay. So, uh, from a from a an ecological an ecological an ecologist uh, point of view, that's that's not acceptable from your from your perspective. No, it's it, it it's it's not a. It, it's certainly not acceptable from, from a landowner's perspective. I mean, if, if we're going to put an SNA on someone's property, we need to be sure that that accurately reflects uh, an area of value. Um, in, in many cases, it, it doesn't. And um, so, no, not in my view. Uh, even, even, even though there's a, a qualification that these should be uh, ground truth, I think, in the RPS, um, do, do, do you know how we got into this situation? Should they, should what was presented to the uh, district council should it have more accuracy, and then and then be ground truth for further accuracy? Um, Want to comment on that, or, or or you prefer not to? Well, I prefer. I mean, ideally, it should have been more accurate because it's. It, it, it's uh, based on what the 40 sites that we saw. It's not. Uh, it, it's not in a state that's really uh, should be going on to a district planning map, uh, and uh, right. it's certainly causing concerns for the landowners, understandably. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. Okay. Well, let, let's accept we we've got a problem here, and hmm. I think, Mr. Chibnall, you've um, said, well, okay, this is the way I think we should deal with it. And you've um, you've put forward the uh, definition approach uh, to to cover uh, areas that, um, as you've explained, meet the appendix two but are not identified. When you start to look at what you've that option you've put, um, some submitters have raised, and, and it's it's not a bad point, and that is. Um, if you accept your proposal, you're, you're actually enlarging what was actually notified, aren't you? Because, you know, I think, I think 
uh, the point was made in the surveying company uh, submission um, that, and I, I've got a note here, according to them, it would have the effect of enlarging the SNA provisions from 698 sites to almost the whole district where SNA rules apply according to the zoning. And, and so, do, do you agree with that? I can see that, yeah, that that does seem like a really onerous way to um, to to go. Except that there has been there are um, areas of indigenous vegetation out there that haven't been mapped. They were missed, but they're simply not they they haven't been um, captured in the mapping. So it, it would be a way of bringing them into the into the fold as well. Um, and it is. Yeah, I, I can see that it's a, it's definitely a has made um, all indigenous vegetation up for um, analysis. For sure, well, it's not only it's not only that is it that 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 any landowner who wants to do not indigenous but any vegetation clearance, I've got no idea what the status of you know the vegetation uh, the species t um, and that it, it isn't don't don't they then say well. We can't do anything on our land because we've got to go and get it checked out. We've got to engage an ecologist. Yes. Otherwise, we run we run foul of these. We could run foul of these rules. Isn't that isn't that a a, a situation that that could arise? Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I can see that that situation could arise, which is why I I um, um provided for you know some policy to say that we will we will cover that cost of an ecological assistant if you want to go and do some work on your property because we're going to have to essentially do this um, when the um, national policy statement comes out for biodiversity we're going to have to go and, and do some serious um, mapping and um, anyway so we if people want to come do something then there's an opportunity I'm offering an opportunity to come and we'll contact council which is a little bit how the operative plan works if you want to go and do some work we'll come and have a um do an assessment to see what you see what um you have there but yes i can see that it is definitely an onerous way to go could, for property owners yeah and and um I, I know uh i know the previous plan might have something about um paying for for yeah. for for a an assessment, but this is pretty broad, and uh, the way the definition covers everything. Um, and do you know if you've got council? See, we we can't impose a condition on a third party legally. We can't. No. Um, um, and and that would include uh, as independent commission and commissioners or hearing panel, we can't say, well, the council must meet the costs because we're, it's, the, it's the local authority who has to meet that cost. And there's a distinction between um, a consent authority and a local authority, and I don't want to go into that. But has the council, as a local authority, have they, when we've seen nothing of it, have they just said, well, look, we'll pay for this? Um. Well, like I said, it's in the operative plan now. That's how we function. And and, um, and I don't think there's next, like I said, next year there's going to be no option that we we will need to be able to um, to to fund this and go and, and ground truth all these sites. It's going to be um, a, a requirement. And um, I, I get the third party approval, but I think it's not, um, the way the policy is written, I don't think it's relying on a anyone um, seeking to do a um, activity. It just means that if somebody, um, well, I suppose, it does if somebody wants to come and do an activity, contact us, and we can come and have a look because and we can, yeah, we're going to have to do it anyway. I think that's what I'm saying. So. Well, the regional council, the the regional council signalled that they, they don't want to pay for anything, haven't they? Well, they have, but it is a, it is a joint responsibility in the RPS that, that, that that's what is what happens. Yeah, and we don't have the we don't have the jurisdiction to impose it on the regional council. That no. you've got to pay for this. 
So I just want to highlight that it's not as straightforward as, as what you've sort of signaled in your yeah. in your um, um, in, in your report. So so if we if we move on and say, well, okay, um, and some of the submitters have said, well, look, you know, why, why not just keep them in the as identified um, areas? Um, and you've you've broken down in in your 42A report, you, you've broken down the the areas, and, and that's in paragraph 16. And I've made some notes here. You, you've said. 70,635 hectares of SNA, that's the area. You've then broken that down into 23,000 as a dock estate. Yeah. 10,000 as a QE trust covenants. And around about 1,400 to 3,500 as a conservation lot covenants. Mm. That's, that's correct? Yeah, roughly. So, so for example, they, they could go into a into the planning maps, couldn't they? Yes, they could, yes. Yeah. So that would leave about half um, on private land. Yes. If, if you were to um, move in a hurry and, and um, ground truth the priority sites that you think are priority sites, over the next six months, how long would that take? Well, how many sites would you get in? Do you know? You've touched on it in 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 in, um, in Mr. Mug's question. You touched on it, but I'm now putting it on you. Um, if if we were to say, well, no, nah, look, um, uh, we only rely on the mapping and put in all those other public type areas but for the private on private land you go off and ground truth and we'll give you six months um i might ask john mr turner to 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 respond to this because he he has a um yeah well the, the, the let me be clear the thirty five thousand hectares of prime private land in six months um that, that might be a that might be a challenge to say the least, I think, to do it yeah. accurately. Yeah. Um, but but I, I realise that you're not going to capture them all, but how many do you think you'd get done? I mean, based on based on what we've done to date, it will be probably looking at maybe 100 in six months. We did 40 in three, but I mean, even bringing new, more resources, we could possibly do more uh, over that time, um, okay. depending on... Uh, Availability of personnel and, and what have you. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, it's, it's, quite a, it's a big job to put put it that way. Yeah. It's a it's a, uh, it's a big and challenging job. All right. Okay. Okay. So that's something that um, you know, no doubt will be debated during the course of this hearing. But if we can move on a different topic and now um, I turn to the uh, rules themselves. Just on my reading of them, there, there appears to be um, little distinction between what is allowed in an SNA and outside an SNA. Mm. Sh shouldn't the outside be made more enabling? Um, it, it, have I got, have you got the rules here? Oh, I just keep my rules, I've got... <laughs> I'm just going to have a look at the rules. So I can... There are some, um, there are some, some slight differences. Um, again, I think that the um, the this this um, approach has been brought over from the operative plan, where there was kind of like a um, a similar approach, where you're either in a landscape policy area or outside. So it was slightly similar approach to that. And I think if you're inside, if I look at the rural rules. Yeah, but I have, I have, I have actually put these into a table, but it's still in, um, 
the table still requires some some fine tuning. Um, so if you're yeah, inside. Look, I, I don't want to go through um, and hold up, uh, but I, I just make the point that it was, and, and I've seen others present, I think Federated Farmers presented that a chart too comparing both and someone else did it. And when you start to look at it, um, I'm just saying to you, well, look, I, I'm not sure whether there is a real difference between the two. And maybe it's something that we, 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 we need to discuss during the course of this hearing. I'm just bringing it up. That's right. So, so I think the main differences are now are just the amount you can clear for building development. Where it's gone from, and if you're in an SNA, it's 250 square metres. If you're outside an SNA and you're in indigenous vegetation, you can be 500 square, um, square metres. So that's yeah, fundamentally yeah. now probably the only the main differences. Yeah, because the, when you look at the RPS, it actually, uh, and this is covered in the submission from one of the um, uh, mining companies in the uh, from. Bathurst, I think, and they make the point that, um, that the RPS is not promoting a no adverse effects regime. So um, um, that 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 point would be relevant to what you can do outside an SNA, I would imagine. So that's something that um, perhaps needs to be look at looked at. Um, just moving on from that. Um, um, I think turning to Bathurst, if, if you could just um, make a note of the points they raise there uh, when they come to give their evidence, because there's some points there that I think you should um, have a look at. Um, I'm making a comment one way or the other. I'm just saying that it seems to me that uh, my preliminary view is there's some some points there that you should look at. Yes. Um, um, the other one is um, uh, in the coastal uh, in the coastal environment area. Um, you've taken almost absolute approach. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something you should have another look at? Um, there, I know, I know, I know what the law is on in the coastal environment and the coastal policy statement, but I just wonder. Way you've framed yours, it's a bit of a blunt tool, isn't it? It is, it is, um, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I definitely appreciate that, um, and uh, definitely open to suggestions how that could be um, um, relieved a bit. All right, and and the other thing is just moving on from that is that the earthworks rule. 22.2.3.1, you might want to have a look at that. It doesn't seem to have a catch-all rule in it. And I think you might want to have a look at that as a discretionary activity. Right, okay. Okay. Um, okay, and I think Federated Farmers has put forward a comparison table. I think you need to check that. Um, I'm not sure some of that may be accurate, but I just raise these points because I'm sure they're going to come out during during the hearing. So that that's that's me. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cooney. You've covered a lot of the ground that um, I was going to cover, so I don't think there's any point in, in going through that again. So I've only got a few questions. Just in terms of the 40 properties that have been ground truth, um, that's been a three month exercise. Can you just in very round terms, tell me what the, the cost of that has been and how many hectares in broad terms have been surveyed or, or ground truth? And I don't want you to disclose any commercial, you know, arrangements between you and Mr. Turner, but, but broadly speaking, what's been the cost to the council of that three month exercise? John, do you want to answer that or? He's on mute. On mute. I'm not on mute now. Um, I'm just trying. I'm breaking down. They had what we've we've invoiced to date. Um, oh no, no, I don't really want to ask. I mean, I don't want you to feel that you have to disclose. Um, you know, your invoicing. Perhaps I can ask. I don't know if Mr. Mr. Gauntlet or Mr. Ibano or Ms. Rat can just 
give us a, a, a broad number that says, look, the ground truthing exercise has cost council in terms of staff time and the way that we accumulate costs and so on and so forth has cost in the order of X. What would X be? Can anyone can just that. enlighten me on that? I, I just mindful of Mr. Turner. I don't want to ask Mr. Turner for his invoicing details. I don't it's think it's, it's, it's hard ask. to give it. Sorry, you can answer it, Ms. Chibnall? Yeah, in the realm of um, $100,000 plus. Okay, and how many hectares? It's probably in the table, but I don't recall seeing it added up. How many hectares of, of SNA has been ground truth on that basis? About. And then I will let Mr. Turner answer. All right. I could, I, I, I wouldn't have a figure for that, to be honest. It's, uh... I, I'm only after, I mean, I can go and look at them all and add them all up later, but in broad terms, are we talking, you know, 50 hectares, 1,000 hectares, 10,000 hectares? I, I would put it at, at less than 500 hectares. Less than five, yes. yes. Okay, no, that's okay. Thank you. That's what I'm trying to get some sort of handle on. Um, and if the suggestion's been made by Mr. Cooney, well, or the, not, not, necessarily a suggestion that raises the prospect of saying, well, maybe between now and when the hearings process finished, you could ground truth a bit more. And you said to him in six months, you could do another hundred or thereabouts. Mm. If you're focused on the important ones that were perhaps more likely to be obvious so that they didn't need, you know, in-depth surveying, you know, they, you could sort of walk around the perimeter and go, it's pretty obvious that complies with the criteria. If you were, if you were to, if you were to take a six-month period and you were, um, what's the word? Focused on what you thought were likely to be the higher value areas, and you focused on those where you could get the most bang for the buck. How many hectares more do you reckon you could add to the list in that hundred sites that you mentioned? And broadly speaking, how much budget would you need? Okay. Um, I mean, it, and I'm not holding you to it. I just want to get a sense yeah, of yeah, what, yeah. what sort of work we're we're possibly contemplating. I mean, you know, we're, talk, it we're talking. Enough. Yeah, you're talking about a, 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 perhaps a higher level uh, approach rather than a, a detailed assessment. To well, no, I'm saying that it's 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 robust, but it's got the level of input required for you to be satisfied, because it may be that you can do it. If it's obvious, you, I'm assuming, yeah. but if something's all patchy and it's some good and some rubbish, you've got to go in there and discriminate. And but, if it's, yes. but if it's much more obvious that there's, you know, a hundred hectares up on the hillside over there and I've walked around the perimeter of it and it's all full of, you know, high value native bush, mm. you probably don't need to go in there and, you know, count each tree and identify it. You can say, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm satisfied that that's, should be in. Yeah. Do you see what um, I'm trying to get at? I, I can see what you're trying to get at. Um, it, it, it is. Uh, if you I had six months, it. if you had six months, we came back again and said, how many hectares have you added to the SNA list and how much has it cost? That's all I want to get a handle on. You, you could probably, uh, you know, maybe another, uh, another thousand hectares. Uh, we could possibly do what we've done. Yeah. Um, on six months, yeah, we definitely don't. So um, maybe well, between, between, between one and two thousand hectares, then, because we could, if we could, we, we could. Um, Did you say two thousand? Yeah, maybe we could refine our approach a bit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and broadly speaking, how much would that cost? Broadly speaking, and I don't mean your fees. I mean, so I'll ask Ms. Chibnall, how much budget would you need to get from Mr. Gauntlet or Mr. Ebeno or the mayor or somebody to do it? Um, well, they've just given me a figure for the first lot, which is 115k plus staff time. So, um, um, so, it's, so, so it's a couple of hundred. That we're talking a several hundred thousand dollars, yes. aren't we? Yes, it, we are. In, it, it, we're not. Yeah, okay. We are. And how much of that's in the in the district plan budget? Mm. Um, not that much. Very presumably, little. presumably either north or very close to it. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. That's helpful. That, I, I'm only asking that for context. That's, yeah. So that's the, that's the only reason for asking it. 
I suppose the, the, the question when it comes also to, and I, well, I think I formed a similar view to the hypothesis that Mr. Cooney explained, and that is that by including the criteria without mapping, you're actually putting more of a, and I'll use the word advisably, you know, blight on, on private land yes. than, than by the approach that's there, because basically everything that's a, a that's a, a native species presumably has to be checked out by somebody, which also begs the question is if it just got chopped down and it was at the back of a farm somewhere, who would know, how would it ever be enforced, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess I'm, I'm wanting to, if you could clarify how much of the direction that you've taken in terms of the rules in particular has driven off the draft national policy statement on biodiversity and how much of it's driven off what the RPS says about protection of indigenous vegetation and significant habitats of indigenous fauna. And in, in terms of the vegetation clearance rules or, or uh, just generally, just, just generally. generally. Um, the, uh, in terms of the, um, the national policy statement, um, Definitely was mindful of the um, their approach to well proposed approach to Manuka and Kanaka, um, and I've tried to um, provide for the pasture maintenance in that regard for managing that species, um, and because it is, okay. it is, and I think for the regional policy statement it it. Um, it's just like it's balancing the two, you know, protecting and maintaining it, enhancing it versus the um, allowing people to still function on their. On their don't, don't we have to be a little careful about the draft NPS biodiversity? I mean, I would imagine that if, you know, if this chapter in one district plan has caused quite a lot of concern. You can't go to the bank on what a draft NPS says because um, it may change quite dramatically. And don't we have to be careful not to embark upon a, a process that in six months or 18 months, whenever this document finally emerges, because it's been a long time in the gestation, mm -hmm. you know, you could, you, could, you could have spent a hell of a lot of effort and landowners could have spent a lot of money for no actual statutory purpose. So I, I'm just posing the question for, to you about how much regard we should be having to a planning document that's a draft, that's not yet in play, that may change, that will require budgeting completely outside the realm of what's available in terms of council's normal operating budgets. Do you see what I'm getting at? I, I'm just somewhat nervous. Okay, look, and uh, yep. Yeah, um, as far as the um, the the national policy statement, uh, um, uh, um, I haven't relied on that um, specifically too much. It's more been the RPS. Okay. Um, and the um, where the RPS, although it says I, to identify SNAs, it doesn't actually doesn't actually require us to map it. It just says to identify it. And so I'm more focused on on um, how the, what the RPS is requiring than and but being mindful of that we that the NPS may drive us down the mapping. Okay, no, no, that's helpful. I'm, I'm, that's fine. I, I just can I just ask you a little bit though. I think it's policy 11.2 of the RPS, which is the one that hits the the spot in terms of protection. And and let me just read a couple of provisions to you. The, the first part, 11.2.1, talks about identification of areas, and I, I don't really want to focus on that, but I want to talk about what protection is. And it says, regional and district plans shall protect areas of significant, and significant. I'll call it biodiversity because it's easier to read out, I don't have to read out vegetation and so forth. So it says, protect areas of significant biodiversity require that activities avoid the loss or degradation of areas of significant biodiversity in preference to remediation or mitigation, require that any unavoidable adverse effects are remedied or mitigated, 
where those adverse effects are unable to be avoided, remedied or mitigated, as per the above, um, more than minor residual effects shall be offset to achieve no net loss. Then there's things about how you might remediate an offset. And it seems to me that there's an awful lot of stock taken in the word avoid in one part of that policy, which is not really avoid full stop, it's avoid in preference to remediation or mitigation. So this clear, it seems to me on its face that there's clearly a hierarchy proposed. Um, and, and I just wonder if, if we were to adopt, for example, and, and you haven't recommended they be accepted, but some of the submissions, for example, of the Department of Conservation were, were to be enacted or to be in, included. We're going quite a long way beyond what the RPS is telling us. Do you, do you agree with that? I will have to have a, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'd have to have a re um, study of the, of the hierarchy and, and, and DOC's um, uh, recommendation. I think we accepted some of the recommendations in regard oh, to. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm not trying to be, and I'm not trying to be um, pejorative in any way or, or point any fingers at anybody. I'm just trying to, to say that, you know, that the, the department's submission is that, you know, biodiversity needs to be protected and I don't mean at all costs but it's pretty you know it's it's elevating it to a very high plane which on its face seems to be a higher plane than what the RPS is directing us to and I'm just inviting you to comment on that. Uh, I know I agree yes yes. Okay and in terms of the, the last I think this I think this is the last question the criteria that, that you've adopted, which are based on, as I as I understand it, the criteria in Table 11.1 .1 of the of the RPS. How how directive do you think they are in terms of where the line is drawn between significance and non-significance when we're talking about indigenous vegetation? Does that mean if if Mr. Turner did his exercise and Dr. Deng did his and an ecologist from the department did it and you know so on and so forth is it conceivable that someone would end up with a hundred hectares in the district and someone else would end up with a thousand and someone else would end up with fifty thousand or is it more prescribed than that do you think um, maybe maybe dr uh, mr turner can help me with that um, i i'm not sure the difference would be that great but i think you 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 you're right in the sense that so it's not as prescriptive as um one one might like um and you you will end up with differences between ecologists on what the values of certain areas are and whether something qualifies as, as an sna or not all right now that's that's what i'm just trying to understand mm. um I just want to last question, Ms. Chibnall, and, it's, and it's really is one that Mr. Cooney asked of you, but I'd like to, I would like to ask this one again: is that if we were to do very little at the moment, bearing in mind that there's an end, there's, there's a national policy statement that we're told is due out soon, that's really going to screw the scrum on things or, or lift the bar quite significantly by all accounts. We can we can protect about half the biodiversity in the region by doing very little beyond the status quo, e.g. all the dock land, all the QE2 land, all the areas that you've already ground truth. And you might be able to do a few more if you thought there were some that were pretty high value and in the time available, you'd like to add them to the list. Yeah. But when we look at section 32, and when we look at the fact that there's some pretty directive stuff in the RPS about what the regional council will do in terms of mapping. And, and it seems a little bit rich for the council to say, well, we've done some mapping that clearly isn't that accurate. And I, I don't mean that critically. It is what it is. And it's been done in good faith within budget constraints, I'm sure, et cetera, et cetera. But where that information is, is not robust, Aren't we better to wait until we've got an NPS that's particularly focused on this and and take somewhat of a holding pattern in the in the time that we've got available to us now, rather than trying to do everything and protect everything with a whole bunch of criteria that may change? 
Yeah, I... When we look at it in Section 32 terms, you know, we've yes. got to look at costs and benefits. Yes. And it seems hard to imagine that the 35,000 hectares that, that isn't in an SNA as mapped is somehow all going to be clear felled in the next six months. Yeah, I, I agree that. And, and I think that uh, definitely would be a more um, pragmatic approach. And I think that there would also be the opportunity to, um, to try and, and get better engagement with property owners um, as well. Okay, no, that's very helpful. And I'm, I'm sorry that we've taken so long, um, but I think it's also some of our thinking is helpful probably for the folk that are still to come um, because we wanted to, give them time to think about um, the sorts of issues that we're trying to grapple with. Can I just also say that it comes down to the risk of acting and not acting as mm, well. Mm. And, absolutely, absolutely. I okay. think that's a fair point. All right, well, thank you both very much. Um, we're grateful, as we've said before, for the time, care and effort that you've, um, that you've put into getting us to where we are today. And I think the, the things that Mr. Cooney has raised that are more specific, when he said, if you could think about certain things, what we'd like you to do is think about those. And at the end of the hearing, you could give us your thoughts on, on those having heard the evidence and the, and the questioning of the other parties that are yet to come. Sure. So thank you both very much. We're grateful for, for all that very hard work. Which now brings us to uh, the Regional Council, Ms Foley and Dr Deng, please. Tēnā koutou, ko Mifi Foley toko ingwa, he rāwe te kite e tato e tēnā Thank you for the opportunity to speak at the hearing today. Uh, I have Dr Yeoman Deng here with me. Um, she is a scientist in the geothermal and air land ecology and contamination team at the Regional Council. And we also have uh, with us in support uh, Dr Paul Dutton, who's also in the same team. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Deng is going to present her um, ecological evidence first, after which I will um, present my planning evidence. And she's got a presentation. Yes, which we, which we, uh, thank you for providing that uh, ahead of time too. We, we've got that. So we could perhaps put that on the screen, Mr. Bell. Um, Yendon's going to run it because yeah. she's got a couple of animations in there. So okay, that's fine. Thank you. Can you see that? Yes, we can, thank you. Oh, thank you. And we have, and we have had the opportunity to um, to see this as well. So, thank you, uh, thank, thank you, you Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, hearing chair and the panel. Uh, so, my first slides probably give you some clarifications. So the question has been asked this morning. Uh, so, this is overview. Sorry, this is overview of the SNA. This is overview of the SNA uh, process. Uh, the diagram shows uh, we started with uh, biovegetation mapping based on the national level. Uh, then we against the mapping polygon, polygons to assess the SNA uh, uh, just using Waikato Regional Council RPS. Then further ranking through the implementations, then feedback and monitoring to update, update the SNA data set. Uh, having been said uh, a lot, so, so important things to know. So initial SNA mapped at the scale of one to 10,000 is not on property scales and also the individual vegetation uh, types like some weeds uh, could not identify by this scale. The next is the initial SNA data is a desktop inventory uh, is uh, based on literature review and also the local knowledge of the existing information. So the aim of the SNA from the Waikato Regional Council, so this project is identify areas where management actions will help to achieve goals. 
So this goes using integrated management, uh, landscape management skills. So such as, as we can find with corridors, with linkage settings. So in this way, uh, because many of the main drives of biodiversity loss operate at the landscape uh, scales, like the fragmentations, vegetation clearance, and the waste inventions. So this is the scales at which biodiversity protections and the maintenance should be addressed. So the following points are linked with my submission uh, uh, points uh, I showed on the left of the, uh, these slides. So first is the work with the case stakeholders. Uh, dating back 2012, Waikato Regional Council set up the, uh, set up the SNA uh, 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 project. Uh, so uh, I would say which was the last district in the Waikato region that we completed a data set for. Therefore, we had learned from the some lessons working with TAs. I would say that his experience was one of excellent cooperation with the district council. So the screen background, as you can see, this is just uh, one of the workshops run, uh, run by the uh, Waikato Regional Councils. In this workshop, we have case stakeholders, which run in uh, 2014, I think. And uh, we have a very important agreement was uh, both Waikato Regional Council and the District Council should use one uh, data set for the SNA management. So because of this uh, great effort, uh, we produced the, the uh, I will talk through, uh, it's called the provisional SNA data set. On the, left my, uh, on the left map, you can see, so the different color indicate different significant levels from the, the green is uh, uh, nationally, uh, uh, the red is international, uh, blue is uh, regional significance, and, and the, all the organ, uh, oranges are local significance. So this map, from this map, you can see the Waikato district, the hotspot of the biodiversity uh, from the Hunui to the Fanga Marino, then go to the Haramaki, uh, then go to the Kokara forest, the uh, Mount forest, then to the south to the Mount uh, Pura, uh, Puranga. So the, all the private land, uh, land SNAs, as you can see, at this little everywhere in the brownish and the, uh, and the blue colors. So that means uh, uh, that they are very tiny, tiny, but provide the important uh, uh, the, uh, step stone and linkages for the hot spot of the SNA. So left, uh, on left side, as you can see, the proportion of the SNA uh, in each different significant. So total that six to 900 SNA has been identified in this, uh, uh, in this data set. Well, so these SNAs have covered many different ecosystem types from the wetlands to the forest fragmentations, uh, to the sand dune, coast cliff and the Nikon cave, cast land, which is red ecosystem, lakes and the wetlands. So this significant habitat has provided 105 threatened species for their living on these valuable ecosystem types. So the, then I would like to put the questioning to the panel as to why this significant amount of work has not been recognized in the update as an data set, I, I mainly write a section uh, 42 report, option four, four and option five. So the next slides, I would uh, like to comment uh, the review significant uh, uh, natural areas uh, of assessment, uh, which run in 2000, uh, uh, back to uh, March 2002. So in terms of the, this report, uh, I would say Waikato District Council uh, for the ground truth validation of the SME data set is a good direction because it has waste issues and moved some garden environment and earthworms. However, so if you put this report directly in the, the regional, uh, the, in the district proposed plan, I have some issues concerned in this, uh, uh, in this list point. 
So the major focus is a side visit only undertake the SA, uh, which have uh, 40 properties uh, and the property scale through the ecological unit. I will show uh, you in here. I understand that in the rebuttal uh, uh, of the Mr. Champions, they already agree uh, at the docklands in the district plans. So this is uh, just to clarify. Uh, so if you make in the property levels, so these two are bigger the uh, reserve protected land. The green indicates a dockland or protected land, and pink indicates a private land. As you can see this map, so the eco in the ecological point of review, these landscapes are integrated. You could not isolate map, map patch of the private land, ignore the large of the protected land. As the as species could not recognize uh, the cadastral property boundaries. So this is a basic concept of SNA. So next few slides, I would uh, like to uh, address uh, some uh, uh, the incorrect changes to, uh, to SNA states. So on left map, as you can see, this is a property, uh, uh, is a red boundary, and the green indicates uh, SNA line, uh, while the blue line uh, has uh, been uh, uh, suggested in section 42 report to, uh, to should be uh, deleted. Uh, the visit is Manuka and Kamuka, uh, regeneration, regenerated scrap, <laughs> I'll come this point later. But if you say this, uh, 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 so where this uh, SNA was sitting, is a private property, but, uh, uh, but the sitting on the important, uh, the dockland is on the north, is a Mount Coral, uh, is a, in the Ragland is Mount uh, Kariori, and uh, on the on the beach there's a more ethnic uh, uh, there's a more ethnic side from the Dockland, so there are a lot larger of the threatened species uh, uh, in there the, using this habitat in there. So it provides a great step stone uh, or corridors for the threatened species. Well, I have noticed in the Mr. Turner's report. Uh, so in terms of RTS 11, he has ranked as no. So I don't think so this is right because RTS addresses the corridors and the linkages of the SNAs. So this would be a misleading for the landowners if it has, uh, if it has been ranked as no, probably when their protections are just facing their SNA areas. So this is important point. The next slides, I would say more than one examples um, for the deletion of the Manuka and the Kukas. <coughs> so in terms of this area, just this, uh, uh, this blue, if you go to the uh, biodiversity inventory, you look uh, from the south part of the Ragland. So this is actually not Manuka and Kamuka, it's the remnant of the broadleaf coastal forest. The other point, as you can see, the same uh, position as previous SNA that they are in a step stone uh, of the, uh, between the dockland uh, and also the one of some major important argument from Ms. Tern said Manuka and the Kamuka probably not provide the critical habitat for certain species. So my, my argument was uh, here is the overlays of the, um, the national threatened environment. Uh, is public available. So the indicate the, so this written environment has been ranked as a, a category two, which belong to the national priority one that only have 20% or less remaining in indigenous cover. So this priority one is in, term of, in terms of the private landowner from the Ministry of the Environment. So the other argument uh, uh, from the Mr. Turner, uh, he described the, uh, the lower values of Manuka Kamuka. So there's the same context with the pro previous uh, site. As you can see from all these aerial photographs, in 1944, the, 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 the remaining of the coastal land of the forest has been there, but it's distinctly from 1974 to the 2017, they have the same extent of the vegetation there. So I would say Manuka Kamuka in those ethnic areas is not the lower value of the vegetation, it's not a pasture width, 
is not the, uh, the regenerated forest. It's a major at least 46 years of the ecosystem type because Manuka Kanuka played a very important role in the pioneer succession of the coastal forest and also provide the, the great habitat for the indigenous uh, uh, fauna to move from the mountain to the sea. So now I will draw the conclusions. Uh, you have read my points. I just use uh, show this uh, diagram to show uh, what uh, we have discussed this morning. So what is the uh, better options for the district, uh, Waikato dis district proposed plan? So this uh, 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 diagram shows uh, the 7,000, uh, about 7, uh, 730,000 hectares has been identified in, as SNA in the proposed uh, SNA data set. So this data set have a high confidence of 20%. I would uh, uh, have a high confidence to say that 60% are in the rank, has been ranked as a media confidence. Uh, if you compare in this morning, Mr. Chair asked how many hectares, it's not 500 hectares. So the 40 properties has only covered uh, uh, three, 360.25 uh, hectares. So it's only a little bit of the scale of SNAs. It's not a representative of the uh, Waikato uh, uh, district, uh, uh, the indigenous vegetation. Well, so the last slides uh, I would like to revisit. Uh, I would like to re uh, revisit uh, these uh, diagrams integrated as a, a landscape uh, uh, management. Uh, well, so. Uh, the SNA has provided a very important side, which is core side. I, I, I would like to clarify. So dominant, uh, it has been dominated by indigenous vegetation. So this offers a large opportunities for the, the district council to find where the management should be setting. Uh, we should use an integrated, integrated land, land management approach to find where the buffers, where the step stone, as I showed in last slides, so the landowner can have a, a full picture of where they are sitting, so how to manage it. In this way, we can enhance the essential, essential structure of ecosystem, uh, improve the interactions, between organism and environment and strengths the resilience of the ecosystem. So uh, I would say, so in this way, we need to address integrations and the linkages of SNA to achieve sub uh, sustainable management of the remaining indigenous biodiversity in the Waikato district. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deng. I think we might, um carry on and, and hear Ms Foley's planning evidence and then because I think there's probably a fair degree of overlap between the factual and the planning and we'll we'll ask questions that you can pass around between the two of you depending on who's best to answer them so can we hear from you now too please um, Ms Foley yeah absolutely thank um, you uh, I am supportive of a number of the recommendations made in the section 42a report for hearing 21a However, as per my evidence, I have concerns with or comments relating to some of the recommendations in the Section 42A report or the rebuttal report. The first of these relate to the mapping of SNAs. I do not support the recommendation to remove the majority of SNAs from the planning map and instead re rely on the criteria for an SNA contained in Appendix 2 of the proposed plan. I do, however, note Ms Chibnall's recommendation in her rebuttal report to include land managed by Department of Conservation um, DOC and SNA that are QE2 covenanted on the SNA mapping. I support this recommendation. For much of the district's significant indigenous biodiversity, removing the mapping is maintaining the status quo, status quo approach, which I do not believe gives effect to the RPS, particularly section 11 of the RPS, which seeks to address declining biodiversity through policies and implementations, implementation methods aimed at maintaining or enhancing indigenous biodiversity. As highlighted in Dr. Deng's evidence, Mr. Turner's report is not adequately robust or comprehensive to be used as the basis for a decision of this magnitude. 
Further, the plan is progressing through a comprehensive consultation process as per Schedule 1 of the Resource Management Act 1991, in addition to multiple opportunities for landowners to be involved in the lead up to the notification of the plan. In my experience, plan mapping is a representation of reality rather than a confirmation of the exact location or of an item or area on the ground. I note that recent approaches of district plans notified under the New Zealand planning standards contains terms and conditions to address this matter. The panel could consider a similar approach here. As outlined in Dr. Deng's evidence, there are significant risks associated with not showing SNA sites on the planning maps in terms of potential further loss of biodiversity across the district. Identifying SNAs on the plan maps provides a clear and certain way of addressing the, a matter of national importance under the RMA. Not, ma not mapping SNAs places a more onerous requirement on landowners who wish to clear or modify indigenous vegetation under permitted activity standards, as each one will need to engage a specialist ecological service to assess the vegetation. In terms of permitted activity rules, implement, implement, sorry, the implications of having an SNA inaccurately identified on a property are minor or could be mitigated to an extent by a permitted activity standard. Including mapping in the proposed district plan is the Regional Council's preferred position as outlined in my evidence. And this could be done as a variation to the proposed district plan to allow for refinement of the mapping to be undertaken and then added to the plan at a later date. I understand that the National Policy Statement on Indigenous Biodiversity is currently pending approval and likely to be released in April 2021. This would allow a corporation of NPS requirements at the same time through that variation. While this has been undertaken, a more general rule could be included in the plan. Ms. Chibnall has asked for some guidance on what this might look like, so I've suggested a combined rule that applies to Indigenous vegetation clearance rather than separate rules for Indigenous vegetation within an SNA and Indigenous vegetation outside an SNA. An example is included in my summary of evidence. This would mean that a landowner would not need to know if the Indigenous vegetation on their property is an SNA to undertake a permitted activity. Only if they are intending to exceed those thresholds would the landowner need to ascertain whether the Indigenous vegetation on their property is an SNA. The restricted discretionary and discretionary rule framework can then specify different requirements depending on whether the Indigenous vegetation is assessed as being an SNA or not. Looking at the rural zone rules, the permitted activity rules recommended in the Section 42A report for inside and outside an SNA are reasonably similar, as can be seen in the table included in my summary of evidence. I do acknowledge that a combined rule would potentially result in, a slightly, in slightly more stringent rules for Indigenous vegetation that is not significant in a small number of circumstances and may result in some landowners needing to get resource consent where they might not otherwise. But without any maps to guide the identification of an SNA, this trade-off would allow for a simpler rule framework that does not require every landowner to have an assessment of any Indigenous vegetation they propose to clear to know which rules apply. Ms Chibnall raises the potential of some SNA being missed on the maps. I agree with this point. Uh, and as per my evidence, I request a mechanism to manage areas that meet the RPS 11A criteria be included as per our submission point 81.20, should the mapping be retained. As with my position on the mapping, I request that policy 3.2.2, recognize and identify be retained but with amendments to address Ms Chibnall's concerns about cross-referencing to the RPS. The policy is giving effect to policy 11.2 of the RPS, which in turn addresses the requirements of section 6C of the RMA to protect areas of significant indigenous vegetation and significant habitat of indigenous fauna and terrestrial, fresh, freshwater, coastal and marine environments. In relation to my evidence on significant habitat of indigenous fauna, I believe that Ms Chibnall may have misunderstood my point and my evidence in this regard. The Regional Council's submission on the National Policy Statement on Indigenous Biodiversity related to councils not being resourced to undertake surveying, sourcing and disseminating of data or protection of species and this should remain a DOC responsibility. My understanding of this point was that DOC should undertake the surveying and mapping of and overall protection of these species but that DOC should provide this information to councils to include in resource management plans with the aim of habitat protection. As noted in my evidence, there is the opportunity to include additional matters of control and matters of discretion to ensure that the, that habitat that meets criterion three of uh, the RPS 
is considered when activities are proposed that might impact that habitat. Ms Chibnall recommended an additional sub clause to allow for environmental compensation, but noted it would be beneficial for the Regional Council to comment in light of the RPS sub clause 11.1.8b, um, Plan Development, which states that local authorities should consider using other economic instruments to maintain or enhance Indigenous biodiversity. The RPS does not mention its environmental compensation, but it could potentially be considered as an alternative economic instrument. In my evidence, I consider more work should be undertaken to define clear limits as to when and how it should be used. I note that DOC have discussed this in the evidence and suggested a definition. I support the inclusion of a definition of environmental compensation to the plan to provide context and parameters around its use. As per the Regional Council's original submission, I request that policy 3.2.6, providing for vegetation clearance, is amended to recognise that only clearance with minor adverse effects on Indigenous biodiversity will be enabled as a permitted activity, and that the policy is relocated under section 3.1, <coughs> Indigenous Vegetation Habitats, to recognise that it also applies to other Indigenous vegetation, not just SNA. Finally, I would like to respond to recommendation made in Council's rebuttal section 42A report. Ms Chibnall recommends a new non-regulatory policy as follows. Council, in joint responsibility with Waikato Regional Council, will meet the cost of an ecological assessment to evaluate whether an area meets one or more of the criteria in Appendix 2, criteria for determining the significance of Indigenous biodiversity. While I support the intent of this policy, Regional Council has not been consulted on this proposal to assist with funding of ecological assessments. This would be an ongoing commitment of funding for an unknown amount, which would need to be considered through Regional Council's funding and decision-making processes. As this has not occurred, I request that this recommendation be rejected. As noted in my evidence, Regional Council are keen to continue to work cooperatively with the District Council to improve SNA mapping and management across the district. Kilda. Thank you, Ms Foley. Let's, um, I think given that we're into questioning mode and we're quite keen to um, be able to see you more clearly, would you mind unshare whoever's got control of the screen to take that off for now and if we need to put it back up again we can. <coughs> Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Right, let's see uh, how we're going on questioning. Could we um, start perhaps with you, Mr. Mark? Uh, kia ora, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Deng, just in relation Hi. to your PowerPoint and in particular how you, you were very helpful in providing some pictorials around Banga Road 1665. Did you physically actually go out to the site itself? Uh, to the, I have been to the Mount Coral, you mean in terms of the Foki uh, SME site or uh, other? Yes, so where you were referring to 1665 Whanga yeah. Road in relationship to Manuka and Kanuka as an yeah. ecological corridor. Yeah. You physically uh, went there? No. I haven't been there. I yeah, only okay. went to the Mount Korora, which we are very close to the size. I know oh, that's the yeah. environment. Yeah. Just, yeah, Korora. okay, Mount Kariwai. Yeah. Uh, well, um, just, yeah. just getting back to, uh, I think you talk about 3.2 in relation to lack of robust SNA yeah. technical assessment from Mr. Turner. Yeah. What would your view be where, in his view, if we're looking at section 11A of the RPS, Appendix 2, I, I believe he states he's met one or more of the criteria? Yes. In, in doing his assessment, so wouldn't that be okay? Uh, yeah, if, if the site met one criteria, that can be identified as SSA. Yeah. Right. Or and, some and, side of, yeah. and secondly, Mr. Turner is also basing his assessment on the submissions that were filed. Yeah. That would be okay as well too. Yeah, I think on his submission in assessment, something has been wrong because uh, uh, in the previous SNA, so in RPS eleven for the the side uh, three four eight six, that side has been ticked as yes because it provides ecological corridors, but uh, in Mr. Chen has ranked as no, so that was uh, I showed in my slides. So this is a wrong judgment from the okay. side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but thank you for that. No further questions. Oh, yeah. Thank you. 
Thanks, Mr. Mark. Ms. Sedgwick? Um, thank you. I've got a, a, a question for Ms. Foley, if I may. Um, and that is looking at, <coughs> pardon me, that's looking at 2.8 of your um, summary statement. And I'm just wondering, um, in your view, is this the most practical, suitable rule uh, that avoids uh, any unintended consequences? And I am concerned that the, the concept of unintended consequences has come through quite a bit in this. Um, so I wondered if you could expand on that, on that note, please. Um, okay, so the rule that I suggested in my evidence was um, an example of how you could do a combined rule. I'm not suggesting that that is definitely what we need to go with. Um, it's, it's sort of a starting point to demonstrate what it could look like so that um, landowners wouldn't have to get an assessment um, to undertake it, um, Indigenous clearing under those permitted rules. Um, and that, that would only come into play um, if you're exceeding those thresholds. So it's something that we would be happy to continue to work with the district council on to refine um, the, the rule framework to, to make it work, to try and avoid those unintended consequences. So the point of my question is unintended consequences that arise. Um, mm -hmm. And so if somebody does not uh, necessarily know if they've got an SNA or not, mm -hmm. um, it would be rather difficult to expect them to know whether they're going to intend to exceed uh, thresholds. Um, I, I just, I'm unclear of where you're coming from on that. I, I understand what you're saying. I'm reading what I'm reading what you have. Um, but I guess you, it's the same with if you had a a rule for under, under the notified plan. You've got a rule for clearing without outside an SNA and rule for clearing within. An SNA, and you look at the map to define which rule framework you use. I'm suggesting that if the maps aren't going to be there, there's just one rule framework, and so you just need you need to comply with that rule framework to be a permitted activity. But if you're say if you're um, looking to uh, do a building platform that is larger than that specified in the permitted rules, then you would need to get that resource consent and have that assessment, and then work out if it's an SNA or not. Okay, thank you. That's all from me. Thank you, Ms. Cedric. Ms. Gibb? Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question. It's more to clarify if I've understood something right. Um, so it was about the corridors between SNA sites. So um, if the corridor doesn't have um, the biodiversity on it, e.g. it might be pasture and but it is a link between two say for an example two or three SNA sites um, you're are you saying that that they should still class those corridors as SNAs it's a wider picture because there's no boundaries for um, the, the um, indigenous you know protect to protect the indigenous environment is that what you're saying um, my understanding is that it's only the vegetation, not not it wouldn't be applied to pasture land. So where you have um, the fragments of vegetation, um, that's they. So it, it it may not be a continuous corridor, but they're stepping stones that help form a corridor. So it's so practically so it's, speaking. How do you map that? Like practically speaking, you're just saying okay, within a particular site, there's a small section of this. Um, indigenous you know biodiversity how do you how do you map that because if you would you just say with that particular piece within that site is an SNA yes it's not you're not referring to the whole site okay I just no, wanted to no, just that particular oh, yeah I just looked at that picture it kind of made me think it, and then there was the circle around the outside I was worried you were wanting to just have a big overlay um, across all of them you're not saying that. Right. No, no. We're just saying that, that um, you need to look at the big picture of the landscape and that those little bits all add up to form these stepping stones, which make corridors that link these important sites. Okay. Um, and the there was a very helpful graph which showed where um, relativity of the 40 mapped sites was quite small against the whole. It would be really helpful if you had the data 
to show us also um, the graph of the likes of the QE2, the dock land, any notice of requirement land. Um, have you actually gone through that process with that? Um, those uh, yes, uh, this, uh, the, the proportion of the, the QE2s of the protected lands, the graph you described has been published in a significant measure uh, uh, areas of uh, report. In this report, this is online. They have all the proportions of the grant. You can right. uh, find that that's yeah. in this report. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gibb. Mr. Kearney? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, this is probably a question to, um, to both Dr. Ding and Ms. Folly. Um, you the regional council seem to be saying, well, Mr. Turner's uh, assessment uh, really was just the tip of the iceberg and the rest of the, the areas, um, you've got to look at it a bit wider than that. And that um, those maps are more accurate than what he's really tending to portray because, he, uh, because there's no sort of interconnection with the overall mapping. Is that generally what you're saying? Um, I think it's a it's uh, doc, uh, Mr. Turner was was commissioned to look at site specific parts of an SNA, and that's and that's what he's done. And he has identified at a property scale there are some inaccuracies, um, and that's to be expected when you look at it at a property scale. What we're saying is that that he hasn't looked at those sites necessarily in the context of all the S of the the wider SNAs, and that. Um, it is a very small sample that he's looked at of all the properties. There are over 4,000 properties that have SNAs on them. He's looked at 40 of them and recommended changes to around 30 of them. Um, we're saying that it's not necessarily um, the right tool to then apply to make a de the decision across all the mapping. So we're not necessarily criticising his work. He's done what he was asked to do. I'm just saying it's not the, that's not necessarily the right um, evidence enough evidence to then apply that across all the sites. He's responsible that he was asked to look at sites where people have identified there was an issue on their property. Um, majority of landowners have not come forward and, and asked their properties to be looked at, and we can't tell why that is. That may be that they're happy with the SNAs, and maybe that they're not aware of the process, or that they they're just too busy. We 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 can't know that. Um, so we're just saying that the sample size is very small and the purpose of that report was not to judge the overall accuracy of all the mapping across the district. Well, we've got, um, we've not only just got Mr. Turner, we've also had Heinz come forward with their own ecologist. I think it was Heinz. And someone else came forward with an ecologist. They said, no, nah, this this what's been identified on our property uh, is not accurate. And I think there was another one from Bathurst or might have been Genesis, I'm not sure. But another ecologist came forward. So there's two other ecologists that have come forward and said, no, nah, it's not quite accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got landowners who have come along. And we've got a few landowners say, hey, this is our back garden that's been identified. Mm -hmm. So... You know, you, you are saying in your evidence, I think at um, 2.8 in your your um, in, in your summary statement, something about it's, that the mapping that we've got shows is a representation of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure. What do you mean by that? Well, it's, it's with all mapping, um, it is a snapshot in time. Um, and it's also, if you're mapping across the district, it is going to be at a certain scale. For example, if you're, um, you've got a line on a map and you zoom in, then that line gets thick, like thicker and thicker when it's applied like at the property level. Um, it's, so uh, that's why with zonings, a lot of the time it uses a property boundary so that there's a clear um, reference point for where that zone stops and starts. So with all with all your mapping, it is it it does need to be looked at um, at a property scale to determine um, how appropriate it is, and that's why you have a your permitted rules, um, and then you 
when you go to a resource consent, you can have an assessment and determine exactly what is on the ground and whether that, that mapping is accurate or not, like how, you know, whether there needs to be some um, discretion applied there. Well, the, the evidence that seems to be put to us sort of really hasn't reached that position even because uh, if, we, if we take what's before us, uh, on the other argument, we've got Mr. Turner saying there's a high degree of inaccuracy and that seems to be borne out by other assessments done and by property owners. So, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure whether you can say that it is a representation of reality. I, I just uh, question that. Well, it, we've pre prepared the provisional SNA data using a process, but um, as, as be, has been discussed, we aren't able to haven't been able to ground truth all those sites. So it is what is there to the best of our knowledge, but it hasn't been ground truth to make it perfect to the property level. So it, it, it's, right. it's, I guess it's a disclaimer about that while uh, it's about the scale of the mapping and um, that it does need to be, I guess, taken with a grain of salt, but when you look at it at a property level, um, it, you, there needs to be a judgment about exactly where it applies. You say in your summary statement and the evidence that, um, that if you take the definition approach, you you say, well, no, we don't. Regional council doesn't want, doesn't like that, and you say that it it places uh, it, it's too onerous on landowners, and that your that the maps should be left as they are. But don't you don't you really uh, come to the same outcome, whichever approach you, you take? Uh, with the approach that's proposed, um, basically to determine whether you can do any clearing, a landowner will have to get an ecological assessment. And mm. that is, um, uh, takes time. It, there, there's expense to, incurred, whether it's by council or whether by the landowner. Um, it, Whereas what was proposed under the notified plan for the, the, the minor clearing could be done without getting a resource consent, without going to council, without spending any money. So we're saying, you know, it's, that is a lot more that the, the puts, putting more responsibility, more cost, more time on the landowner. And it makes it a more complicated system. And, and, that, and that creates a temptation for landowners to potentially do the wrong thing not have not go to the effort, the time, the expense. So, so we're saying so it's a simpler rule framework. If everyone has, this, if there's a, at least if there's no mapping in, in the short term, that if you have a combined role, so it's clear that if you want to do any clearing, you're able to do it up to a point and anything beyond there, you need resource consent. And that's when the assessment is done and you look at the what the vegetation type is, whether it's significant, and what are the characteristics of that significance so that you make sure that whatever you're doing, that you are maintaining the significance of, and the characteristics that create that significance of that indigenous vegetation. So that's that's a blanket rule that you're proposing to be brought in. In, in the absence to, to of, cover of mapping, the, to, yeah. To cover the problem, is that, yeah. that's basically it? Yeah, that's it. Um, there would be some jurisdictional issues with that, wouldn't there? Because this is that was never notified. This is some. Uh, this is a, a rule that that. And I can see. That, look, I'm not trying to be highly critical of it. I I say, well, good on you for trying to um, pr provide a solution to the problem. But I just do just query whether uh, that your proposed rule, for example, I think you were told away, told to go away and, and look at it. Um, subsequently, and you've come back with a draft, that's never been the subject of any submissions, has it? No, um, I, that, that is the case. Yeah. But I, I guess that's a matter for the panel to consider. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Th okay. Th thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ding. Thank you. I've only got a couple of questions, really, and it's <clears throat> And it might be more of a comment than a than a than a question. It, it seems to me that the whole question of identifying biodiversity at both 
regional scale and district scale is a work in progress mm -hmm. and that we're dealing with incomplete information and that's obvious I think from what we've heard already this morning I, I, I think it's going to be pretty hard for people to to to, to demonstrate otherwise and in addition, we've got an RPS, sorry, an NPS that's looming, which I suspect is going to be a, an absolute game changer. But, and, and so what I'm, what I'm wondering is that it, it seems to me, and I just, this, this is the question part, it seems to me that the regional council is saying, and I, this is not a criticism, it's just how I interpret where we're at, is saying the council's done as much as it realistically can in terms of identifying biodiversity within the region as a whole. It's made that information available to the district. The district's done what it can within budget constraints to do what it can. And then beyond that, we're basically saying, well, because of the regional policy statement, which is the regional council document, we're loading a whole bunch of obligations on, on private landowners. And I just wonder in, in section 32 terms, how we sort of reconcile that, bearing in mind that we're trying to put a permanent solution in place with imprecise information for a process that's gonna be overtaken in very short order by a central government document, which I suspect will have councils throughout New Zealand saying, how the hell are we supposed to fund this? So do you see the, do you, do you agree that we've sort of got that dilemma? Is that, is uh, that a yeah. fair summary? Yeah, so um, I guess in terms of imposing um, restrictions on private landowners, um, I guess it comes down to um, biodiversity being um, a matter of national importance under the R RMA. So we do need to do something about it. And, the, and we've, so the RPS, we've set a framework um, the framework may not be perfect, but that's what we have and that's what we're working towards. Um, in terms of the, the data, um, obviously the process to prepare the mapping for this district plan was started in 2012. Um, we now have improved um, aerial photography. We have oblique um, aer aerial photography, which is actually very helpful in identification of um, indigenous vegetation. We do have a range of tools that would assist in making the mapping more accurate and we would be happy to work with the district plan to do that but it does take some time to do that so that's that's partly why i'm suggesting a variation so that we've got time to work with the district plan we can try and refine the mapping is with the tools that we've got we could look at what areas we can refine through the um the improved um digital data we've got and where ground truthing may um may be um, a better tool um, and then if um, the NPS comes out in April, as um, we are told it, it will, then um, we can look at incorporating the requirements of that through that variation. It just gives that certainty that, um, that the, proce the process is happening to get that mapping done and in, into mm -hmm. the district plan rather than waiting on future um, land changes. Okay. And just final question, regarding policy, 11.1.5 of the RPS, which is the informa information gathering policy mm -hmm. that's directed at the regional council and, and no one else. Yeah. I, I'm happy, I, maybe I can share the screen so that we've got it in front of us, yeah. Yeah. Um, rather than dealing with it off the... I think I've shared the right screen rather than your summary statement, is it? Is that that's right? One. That's right. Yeah. So it says it says the regional council will collect, analyze, and make available the following information for each district and for the region as a whole: extent of the remaining indigenous habitat and ecosystems, extent of indigenous habitat and ecosystem loss, ecosystem health and condition, and indigenous biodiversity trends. Facilitate the establishment of baselines and utilize monitoring information to track progress. And, and it, it would seem logical that, that implementing that policy is, is always going to be a, a work in progress. It can't be done instantaneously. It's going to take time to do. How far through that process is the regional council at the moment, would you say? And what are its plans to 
complete? Assuming that it's not yet complete, what is it proposing to do in the, into the future? Can I, um, can, would you mind if uh, Dr. Dutton jumps in here? Because no, no, absolutely. Whoever's whoever's best place to um, to help you. Yeah. Um, so a lot of those actual, I think, uh, extent of remaining indigenous habitat and ecosystems. That's an actual indicator that's updated every five years for the region. Um, same with the indigenous habitat and ecosystem loss. We're actually working on an ecosystem lost one with habitats at the moment. Um, we're about halfway through the region, um, but that's actually based on the uh, what, 2002, 2017 um, habitats that are being lost throughout the region. Um, ecosystem health and condition, that can be sit more with an ICM, I think. Um, that they're actually looking at health checks of different um, ecosystem types within their priority zones. Um, biodiversity trends, including in relation to no. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not too. I don't. I don't think we need. You know, like forensic analysis of you know each and every one of those. But is it fair to say that that is a work in progress, and that yes. whilst you're updating things as you go, I mean, is there a a heap of work still to be done, or is it nearly complete? Just that, that's the thing, because it takes obviously time to collate this. It's like a living data set, it's constantly mm. changing. Mm. So we can't suddenly go, here's your extent of the remaining indigenous vegetation, because next week it's changed. Mm. But because we have the baseline of, the, of everything. We have the baseline, which was sort of like a, um, yeah, so there was a, a baseline of 1840. Um, and we've actually created um, sort of, um, I suppose, current vegetation maps from that. But isn't isn't the key part? I mean, that's theoretical in so far as you know, no one had cameras or GIS or anything else. You know, there's there's inference to say what what that baseline is. It's not a baseline in the sense of, you know, statistical information that says we had densities of you know. Cody and this location of you know twenty trees per hectare. I mean, there's a lot of art in terms of developing that. But isn't, yeah. isn't the key one? Isn't the key one a one? The extent of the remaining indigenous habitat and ecosystems, because that is the, the that's what I would refer to as the baseline. In so far as that's what's there now, and you've said it's forever changing, which is fair point. But it seems to me that we're not very far along. And correct me if I'm wrong. Of 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 giving effect to a Roman one, so, and that's it. And that's evidenced by the accuracy of the mapping, if nothing else. Yep. So we can actually draw information on that from the land cover database, which is a national data set. Yes. Um, where um, Dr. Yandan Deng described the BioVeg, so that's taken that land cover database and updated it for just Waikato. And is that the information that you're referring to, Ms. Foley, in terms of saying there's an opportunity to have a more forensic look at what's already there in terms of clarifying mapping? Is that is that is, what you're referring to? Of, there's a range of tools. So there's updated aerial photos. There's oblique aerials, which were taken for Cody dieback, which are, um, give a really good um, view of what vegetation types are. There's LIDAR that's been flown across the whole um, of the region. Um, there are potentially some other tools that um, are being worked on that okay. um, also assist. And that's helpful and, and appreciate that offer. I suppose the final question for you then is, given that this NPS biodiversity is due out by all accounts very, very shortly, how much effort do you think that we as a panel in Section 32 terms should go in terms of trying to solve this problem? when the information that we've got isn't that great and it's, like, and it's likely to spawn, you know, a whole raft of new initiatives? Um, well, in terms of the RPS, it, it, basic, it sets the process and uh, sets out expectations what will be in the district plan. So that's what we're really basing our evidence on not the NPS. So the NPS, if it comes in, obviously, it's that high level but, document. No, no, and I understand that, and that's fair, but, but we, we, we'd be, we'd be we, we can't be expected as a panel, I don't think, to, to draw 
a definitive line on in the sand on on indigenous biodiversity matters to try and lock something into a district plan based on a, a paucity of current information. Because well, in, in you, you, you yourself are saying that we, you know, essentially there needs to be a variation. What, why, why would we not actually be as pragmatic and practical as we can be, given what well, we've got available, and okay. leave that debate till another day? Well, the panel have the option of leaving the um, the, the plan as notified. So you could just keep the SNA mapping um, and to keep the rule framework or update the rule, rule framework to make it more flexible and to recognise that there is some level of um, inaccuracy right. at a property scale. So I'm not saying the data isn't necessarily completely inaccurate. It's just when you apply it to a property level, you're going to get some variation. So okay. you know, it might be a metre here or there, or it may have captured some exotic trees on the edge of an SNA. So that's why you have a permitted rule framework. And then you, when you've got a resource consent, you've got your matters of discretion that you look at, or if it's discretionary, you, you're going to be looking at um, what, are the, what is the vegetation? Is it actually significant? And what are those characteristics that make it significant and need to be protected? So I don't think the I don't think what was notified is necessarily that problematic because it's it's just the rule framework could be massaged a little bit just to recognise um, that it does need to be um, looked at it needs to be ground truthed and, and assessed at a property level if you're going to um, be doing any sort of activities which is which are going to impact on it. And that is something that is done by um, Wi-Fi District Council and other councils through their plan. So they recognise that the that there is this SNA mapping and it is a tool to guide decision making and when an assessment is required. No, thank you for clarifying that. That's helpful. All right. Is there is there anything else from the panel? Um, Mr. Chair, just a general um, query as as a result of what's what the discussions have been about. Um, the mention of photography, just as a matter of interest, um, what what part do drones play in identifying areas? And are they do they has has it been developed yet? Um, artificial intelligence to say that the, the photos can identify different species types. Is it is it is is that is it making the job easier? I suppose is what I'm getting at. Um, I'm not sure about drones. Paul might be able to comment on um, that. So drones, are, um, they're used, but they're used um, for only small areas. They can only fly certain distances. Um, well, obviously, the more you pay for them, when you get into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, then they actually start, you can, they can go further. But um, at the moment, we're not really using them. We're using aerial oblique, so we've actually flown the entire region. Um, and we do actually have 330,000 obliques, which we do identify vegetation from. Um, and that's down to species level. Okay. The only problem is having the actual manpower to be able to look at all these images and identify the vegetation. So what we've also got going at the moment is um, we've got models um, that can actually identify vegetation through, the, um, through different pixels, and we're using that as well. Um, so we've, we've initiated one with Kakatiya, so we can try and get a computer to identify Kakatiya for us. And then that will, we can train the computer to actually identify, if we give it a training set, to then go and look at all other photos and pull out the same pixels and then provide those that data set back to us. All right, Th thanks for that, thank you. And, and I think we've got no further questions. So thank you very much for your evidence and summary today. And um, we're appreciative of that. We're going to carry on uh, to hear from both Genesis and, and Mr. Tate. I, people may be getting concerned that we're getting behind time, and that's true, but I'm pretty confident that we'll make time up as we get into the swing of things. Both the, both the Section 42A report and the Regional Council um, material are sort of at the heart of, of things. Um, and it's been helpful to us to tease some of that out. So we've taken quite a lot of time to date. I don't anticipate that that's going to be the case for the rest of the um, for the rest of the day. So we'll now hear from um, Mr. Matthews from Genesis, um, noting that I'm going to turn my 
machine off and leave you with Mr. Cooney to chair the session, given my um, relationship with both Mr. Matthews and Genesis. Thank you. All right, Mr. Matthews, do you want to, do you want to start? Thank you. Well, uh, I trust you can, uh, you can hear and, uh, and uh, able to see me at the moment. Uh, you will see that I uh, presented a, um, a summary notes um, document for, for the hearing today, and I'm just going to refer to that. I don't intend to take a lot of your time. Uh, if I look at uh, number two on the, the notes, I'll start from there. I generally agree with the section 42A report for hearing 21A, uh, recommending acceptance of several Genesis submission and further submission points. And in particular, I agree with the change in approach to the uh, uh, to remove the identified SNA areas from the planning maps uh, that have not been ground truth. Uh, but I disagree with amending the definition to include areas that uh, meet one or more of the criteria. Uh, I note that Ms. Chibnall re recommends that the SNA areas, the subject of the Genesis submissions, be removed from the planning maps if they, as they have not been ground truth, and I agree with that, uh, sought that those areas be removed as they are not natural as well. It's not just that they haven't been mapped, uh, they've generally been planted by uh, Genesis and are maintained uh, as part of their, um, their activities. Uh, I agree with uh, Ms. Chibnall's recommendation that they be removed, uh, but note that that would not preclude them from subsequently being identified as SNAs under the proposed definition. Uh, paragraph 133 of the uh, council rebuttal evidence, Ms. Chibnall states that it would be useful to understand why Mr. Matthews considers a landscape area should be excluded from being captured when it, it may have similar or more value than a naturally occurring SNA. And I note that the areas I refer to are not necessarily uh, landscape areas, nor are they areas planted to offset impact on or restore existing natural biodiversity areas. They are simply uh, areas that have been planted uh, in order to mitigate effects of the activities that are around, or in some cases to uh, just provide some um, indigenous area to, to accompany the existing activities. The areas that Genesis has particular concern about are those areas that have been planted or established as part of their ongoing activities associated with the operation of the Hundley Power Station. And just note there that the, the mapping identifies areas in front of the station and some areas on the Scott Farm property, uh, which are associated with um, uh, with the ash pond areas. And some of those ash pond areas are naturally occurring. They, they are areas of um, former parts of the river channel that, uh, that, are, that have some uh, biodiversity value. Uh, so they can appropriately be called natural areas, but that's where the mapping on the ground becomes important to say well, what's planted, what's actually natural. Um, I note that those areas that Genesis has a concern about, uh, they, they may need to be altered at some point to enable the ongoing Genesis activities uh, on the site. And that includes simple vegetation maintenance to uh, avoid interference with um, existing infrastructure or to uh, maintain the, the, the drainage uh, channels, etc. They often require active management to ensure that the values are retained. Uh, and uh, there's an area south of the ash ponds in particular that has been established as a natural area, but uh, some of the, um, the channelization and, and um, work that's gone on in that area does need to be maintained to um, protect those values. <laughs> These areas are often established to meet resource consent uh, requirements and uh, therefore may require management uh, interventions that are required under the resource consent conditions that are not necessarily the same as the, um, region, the district plan framework. Uh, so uh, you, you have this dilemma of, do you comply with the district plan? Do you comply with your consent? Um, I also note that they, these areas do not necessarily require the high level of protection identified in the proposed plan. In other words, 
the, uh, the criteria to avoid uh, adverse effects at the highest level uh, because they need to be adaptable to accommodate the existing activities on the site as well. So uh, it, it's a real fundamental issue of, is the area significant? Is the area natural? Is it therefore a significant natural area? It's, uh, it's quite a logical argument, I guess, in that sense. I note that the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management uh, includes an exception for constructed wetlands, which include wetlands constructed by artificial means, uh, unless it was constructed to offset impact on or restore an existing or former natural wetland. And similarly, the draft National Policy Statement uh, identifies exclusions with respect, for example, to managing plantation forest or biodiversity areas. These approaches confirm, in my opinion, that different approaches are appropriate for areas of a biodiversity that are created rather than natural, and that the simple meets one or more of the criteria in Appendix 2 uh, for determining significance of indigenous biodiversity proposed uh, as the definition for SNAs is insufficient to identify as areas that should be regarded as what are actually significant natural areas. The, the amendment to the definition does not distinguish, as I've said, between natural and those created, um, nor does it include any consideration of the level of significance or, or value of those areas, other than saying, for example, that it might have um, a particular um, biodiversity or a particular um, plant or animal that's, uh, that's there that's of a um, threatened status. For example, if your, your wetland just happens to uh, be occupied by a black mudfish, you're automatically a significant natural area, even though that, that may not have been the intention of the uh, setting that side of area. We've aside. heard about the black mudfish and other and in other hearings as well. Yes, yes. I, I've, sadly, I've been hearing about black mudfish for the last 42 years, I think. Um, <laughs> how many have you seen? Uh, <laughs> Actually, surprisingly, quite a few um, that uh, quite often um, on site inspections, interestingly, um, often found in uh, hoof prints in wet areas uh, where cattle have actually sunk into the dirt, the, uh, the mudfish accommodate the uh, climatise in the, uh, in the hoof prints. Um, okay. My experience, anyway, you, you can often find a couple in each hoof print. So, uh, yeah, quite an intriguing species. Uh, so, yeah, moving away from what's significant and what's natural, there's also discussion within the 40, Section 42A report regarding Genesis submission on providing for environmental compensation. And I see that some changes have been proposed there to uh, clarify that we are talking about environmental rather than economic compensation. I agree with that. Um, in my rebuttal statement, I note that Ms Foley uh, for the Regional Council considers that if an activity cannot avoid, remedy, mitigate and offsetting is not feasible, then the activity should not be consented. Uh, I think that's too simple uh, a statement. I disagree with that and that there will always be situations where offsetting is not always feasible and there may no, be no other practicable option uh, or that there's a functional or operational need to locate in the SNA. Um, and, uh, the, the Waikato Regional Policy Statement itself recognises that. So that uh, there do need to be some provision for exceptions. Um, that said, I'm, I'm not suggesting that the uh, rule framework should allow for uh, wholesale development of infrastructure in um, Dock Estate or anything like that. It's, uh, it, it's being practicable about it. I consider that the biodiversity provisions in the district plan need to recognise avoidance, uh, that avoidance of effects is not always possible, nor is it necessarily required under the RMA, uh, in that that's not a no effects statute, and that there may be no other practicable option or that there's a functional or operational need to locate in an SNA. And that's, I'm talking in particular about infrastructure providers like Genesis in there. Uh, in my opinion, there needs to be a practical and workable mechanism for management of effects while protecting the values of significant indigenous biodiversity, uh, which doesn't 
automatically assume that any indigenous vegetation is significant or natural. Uh, we need to have some practical way of working through that. In his evidence uh, statement for the Director General of Conservation, Mr. Riddle states that he considers that it is inconsistent with the regional policy statement to qualify the avoidance statement in the policy with an exception to that avoidance for specific activities that need to be enabled. Uh, in my opinion, the Waikato Regional Policy Statement directions clearly provide for and direct that the district plan include provision for exceptions of the sort that Mr. Riddle considers are inconsistent. So yeah, there are exceptions for, uh, for example, um, significant infrastructure. Mr. Riddell also states that environmental compensation intrinsically results in a reduction in the values and attributes that make an area significant. I do not agree that, uh, that that necessarily results in a reduction in the value. In my opinion, environmental compensation can achieve the same and often better biodiversity outcomes than strict, strict adherence to a biodiversity offset approach. Uh, and in relation to that, in her statement for the Director General, uh, Ms. Corkery comments that it, it is this rigorous process and the objective quantified evaluation associated with biodiversity offsetting which make, a, make it a preferable option to environmental compensation. However, in my opinion, based on practical experience of this, uh, it is the rigorous process and the objective quantified evaluation associated with biodiversity offsetting that makes offsetting actually really difficult to implement in practice and sometimes impossible to achieve in practice. Uh, which reinforces the need to have environmental compensation options for uh, available for managing biodiversity effects in actual situations. Uh, in my opinion, there needs to be a practical, practical and workable mechanism in the proposed plan for management of effects while protecting values of significant indigenous biodiversity, uh, which doesn't automatically assume that uh, just because it's uh, indigenous vegetation, it is significant or mm. natural. Thanks. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Matthews. I'll just see if the panel's got any, any questions of you. Um, Ms. Sedgwick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Matthews. I do note your points uh, about the mapping and the dilemma that you're facing between natural versus planted. Um, could, you, could you tell me uh, in, your, in your notes, you talk about uh, management um, interventions being inconsistent with the district plan, uh, but then you need to accommodate ongoing use of the site. And I'm not clear where those boundaries are. Without a specific example in front of me, it's, it's, it's hard to explain, but it's the sort of thing that uh, says that you must, um, for example, in, in relation to the, the Genesis ash bomb, you, you, you must maintain the integrity of the um, the, the uh, impoundments that contain the uh, the ash and make sure that it's uh, that it's able to be there, and so that encroachment of that uh, planted area onto the pond embankments um, actually has to be managed and, and that vegetation removed so that it's not destabilising the the pond, and that's where that sort of an issue may actually not be provided for. You have to get a separate consent under the uh, district plan to actually remove that vegetation. So they may conceivably have been part of the original consent. To exactly, yes. As, as a mitigation. Um, no, no, that, that's all at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gibb? Um, yes, thank you. I was thinking along the same lines um, about the conditions put on, resource um, conditions put on, people, developers, whoever, who create these things, and then they are na natively planted with native plants. And we need to distinguish, I was thinking along those same lines about how we practically distinguish between those. And um, there will be um, conditions on those consents that they will need to maintain whatever they've planted. So. I am, I, it'll be interesting to hear back from the report writer how these can be distinguished as you have suggested, because I'm sure there are many other people that would be thinking similarly to that. Mm -hmm. so and, really and I, yeah, no, I, I think the, to be fair, the, the genesis um, concern about that is relatively small scale. 
But if you get into some, for example, some of the mining activities uh, or even the um, uh, Waikato Expressway um, developments, extensive areas of um, mitigation established there where there may be some, uh, some ongoing issues uh, on a much larger scale than the Genesis situation. So, so yes, it, is, it, it could potentially be a problem for quite a few uh, infrastructure operators. Yes, thank you. So thank you very much. It was very some very good points made. Thank you. Mr. May, uh, no real questions, Mr. Matthews, just simply thank you. But I guess going forward, you know, identifying indigenous biodiversity is one thing, but actually putting a putting the meaning of what is significant, and I take your point that that is a mechanism, needs to be thorough. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the, the question. Uh, and I think the, uh, the other underlying point is I don't think anybody is there deliberately setting out to uh, uh, remove these areas. They want to manage them appropriately and practically. Oh boy. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Matthews, if we could just um, look at what you what you're you're saying at a at a high high level, um, you, you say that areas that um, have been been planted out uh, they're not natural, therefore they should be exempt from the SNAs and that type of thing. But um, but they in terms of of the values and attributes to those planted areas, don't they become an SNA? Yes and no. And I, and I think you're, you're absolutely right in that um, in some instances, a, a mitigation area is established for the purpose of becoming for example, a conservation, using that term loosely, a conservation area that is retained perhaps in perpetuity. Uh, whereas other areas may be part of just the ongoing management of a site. And there's a subtle di distinction between the, between the two. And it is it's quite possible, for example, that uh, if you establish an area with a Q, um, QE2 covenant over it, then that does become that uh, significant area that is preserved for the future and you formally recognize that. Equally, that's the role of perhaps the uh, the site mapping, the detailed site mapping to say, yes, this area is within, but these areas aren't. It isn't it, you, you can slice and dice it whichever way you want to, but you still get back to the point that whatever However, it got there. It's at some point it becomes it has those values and attributes of a of appendix two or whatever the the assessment criteria is. Mm. So you're left with your SNA sitting there. There may be a whole lot of reasons or why it gets there, but you still can't get round that. Isn't isn't and you, you seem to be saying well there, there should be some distinction there. But isn't that rather a complex approach when you're really looking at what the rules provide to allow for modification to those particular I, I, areas? I, I think you're right um, in that Appendix 2 is looking at the value, biodiversity values. What we then do is take, well, what the proposal is, is to take those um, Appendix 2 values and convert them into, in some ways, what I would call an arbitrary definition distinction of an area to be significant, mm. or not significant, or natural, yeah. or not natural. Yeah. Uh, but really what we need to focus on is what are the rules that actually govern um, yeah. management of those, uh, of those values. Yeah. And, and if we can find some practical way of managing those values in a given situation, that, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, all right. Okay. Um, just as a matter of interest, does, do you know if the draft uh, uh, national policy statement makes a distinction between non-natural and natural? Uh, I, I don't believe it does, although, as I noted, there are some exclusions uh, that are included in there. The, the plantation forestry one is an easy one to okay. highlight because there's understory right. and stuff like that, but um, yeah, there are some exclusions in there. Okay. All right. Th thanks very much for that. Um, thank you. So. Um, but we'll now get um, um, the chairman back again and maybe 
maybe he might have morning tea. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, yes, I am. I I am back. Thank you. Um, I think we will take a, a ten minute break. We've been going for a long period of time. Um, but we'll, I think we'll take 10 minutes rather than 15 as is normal and we'll resume again. We'll make it 12 and we'll resume at 5 to 12. Um, and we'll hear from Mr. Tate at that point. Mr. Tate, we'll also, we've received information from you immediately before we started this morning. Um, thank you for providing it. Um, it would have been helpful if we got it earlier, but we will read it during the break so that you don't need to read it out and you can do what we talked about at the start of the um, the proceedings that is giving us a, a, a summary of what your concerns are and what you want us to do about it. So we'll adjourn now until five to uh, five to twelve. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Welcome back. Um, Mr. Tate, are you are you there? Yes, you are. I'm here. I'm still here. Thank you. So, all right, we've, we've, we've had the opportunity now to read your um, your summary statement. We previously read your submission itself. So, um, over to you. Okay then. Um, since you've read what I've already was going to produce this morning, I've written down. I've just done, jotted down a few of my concerns that you asked me to. Thank you. Before the meeting, um, this process seems to be quite a long. So you know, take, it's taking a long time to do anything. I mean, this goes back to 1991 when the Resource Management Act stated that it wanted to protect native bush on, pub, on private land. The, um, and, and the thing is with it, it's the, the councils don't seem to be aligned with the government with what, what's, what the government wants. I know you said that the, there's a, a, a process coming up in a while where the government's going to announce what their guidelines of what they think is going to happen or what's to happen. But anyway, I mean, this is a bit overwhelming for me, so you just have to put up with some of the things I have to say, okay? That's right, now you, in your own time and in your own way. Okay. Well, the process of the mapping through this, through what I've heard this morning seems it's actually quite flawed. It hasn't been done that well. And I also find that the, um, of the 698 mapped areas, only 40 people have complained about it. Um, and I'm just wondering, with the other 658, will they have SNA put on their property and they'll have to sort it out later if they don't agree with it? And, uh, and, and this whole process is really now is that you're getting an SNA slapped on your property and now it's up to the owners to prove that it's either not an SNA or the, or the justification of why it shouldn't be on there. Right. Now, now, I'll discuss a couple of the properties of that. There was a couple of issues with 72 James Road. It's deemed as a, a wetland area. I mean, the problem with it is in the 1970s, the late 70s, a flood control system was put in place and a weir was put on the lake to control its level in the summertime because it used to run quite dry. Well, the problem with it now is that we're having flooding on a consistent basis in the winter time, where the level is exceeding the level of the pasture. Now I've got a, I've, I've got a photo here of, of what the, the lake bed is in the summertime, if you can see that. This is the lake bed. Yes, about yeah, I think we can. About four months of no flooding from the Lake Hakanoa. And uh, personally, I'd just like to have some sort of control on, of, of rung up the regional council regarding who controls the flood level of the lake, and they put it back to me saying that they they control the quality of the water, but they don't control the flooding of the lake or the level of the lake. And when I ring the council, they have given me numerous emails where they're getting responses from the regional council. So it seems to be, appear that no one from the two organisations really know what one another is doing. And in the, in, on, on every occasion when the water levels dry out on these things, so I have a problem. I have to go around and pick up three to 400 dead carp that have generally landed in the, in, the, in the paddocks. And if I don't do that, the stench is just overwhelming. I have to actually get them and put them in the offal hole. Okay. Now, that's 72 James Road, Huntley. Now, 185B Hackramata Road, we have a property there of about 35 hectares 
the, the back of the property that they want to put into an SNA. I, I mean, when I first bought this property in 1987, it was a goat unit and it was a, basically a gorse and pasture ridden property. We retired a lot of that land at the back because we decided that it was uneconomic and the rest of it we planted in forestry as a so-called retirement fund. And the, at, at the moment, the, we are concerned about it having an SNA on it. Some of it may be relevant to have an SNA on it, but we're concerned about the, um, because we have been approached over the years about people wanting to put uh, with, uh, zip lines and rec recreational area businesses on it. With, at the moment, we um, have quite a, let quite a bit of the public come over the property. They, we have pig hunters, we have um, police search and rescue that used to come over, train their dogs. We used to have numerous trampers and, and hikers that want to go through the property with, and we let them go through it and they hook up to the Hakramata track and walk back down to the stairs, back to the, to the um, beginning of the track that the council put in. The, um, we are just concerned about if we want to do anything in the future that we're needing to have to go through a resource consent process and we don't know what that entails, we don't know what the conditions are going to be putting on us and we don't know what, uh, what we can and can't do with the property. The, the thing is these areas are a public interest area and in the future are going to be highly sought after because of the way the Waikato is expanding, the population growth is growing these areas, especially the Hakramata Ranges and, and part of our properties, we're, which are still in private ownership, have the ability to, to create a tourist or a, or a visitor venture approach that in the future will be highly sought after. And we feel that locking up these areas now or putting restrictions on them, where we have to go through a resource consent process to, um, to establish what we can and can't do on the property, I don't think that's really in the public interest. And, and, and the other thing is with these areas, they are, I mean, we have, we know what the value of it is. We've set aside these 35 acres at the, bot, at the back and we've let the, we've sort of, we sprayed all the gorse, we got all the, the, the tea tree and the trees coming back. We sort of hand seeded some of the tea tree areas to, to get a thing. We've had a lot of help from Doc over the years. We've done 1080 drops on the property to get rid of the pests for pest control. We've had people come and get rid of the goats and we've had other um, entities trying to sort out like the tobacco, weed and that type of thing that we have on the property. We have no, had, had no help from the council whatsoever on these processes and now they deem that they want to have an input on what we, what we are doing, we would rather work with DOC. DOC seems to have more in tune with what is happening in, the, um, in these areas. But, but anyhow, I mean, I know you've got a hard decision about working with government directives and you've got two sort of fractions here with the district council and the regional council, which I don't think seem to be on the same page of what is um, what needs to be done. And, and I mean, sometimes simple solutions are what, are, are what they needed for this thing. So, like in some ways, I mean, this, these areas are well sought after. The public needs to get on board. I mean, they can they could crowdfund a property in the top of the North Island, or top of the South Island for two and a half million dollars to get some remote beach back into private ownership. I think you need to market yourself a bit better and get on board the public because I'm sure they are willing to pay to have these areas set aside and valued in the future. I mean, at the moment, there's you know you you've got no budget, you've got no funding to do this thing, you're trying to do it on the cheap, which is, which is historically what New Zealand has always done. And you need to actually, before you start a process like this, you need to have a fund of money there because you can't just go on and, and, and draconally say, we're going to put an SNA on all these properties and expect private people to accept it. I think there is value in there and I think that you need to to identify that and you need to identify that there needs to be some financial recompense for what you want to do. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tate. That's pretty clear, I think. Let's just see if there are any questions for you. Um, Ms. Gibb? Um, 
No, not specifically, except I'm, I'm kind of getting a bit of a mixed message over the Hakari Mata Road property. Um, I mean, I understand your concern about the, the Huntley um, farmland, and but I, I'm a little confused. Um, do you or do you not agree with an SNA on that? Because on the one hand, you think it should be preserved. The well, top well, part, what the I'm other. trying to say there is that over the last 30 years, we have initiated a, a recovery of that bush area, okay? And we feel that, I mean, I've talked to neighbours with, with as well, we feel that we don't need to be told what to do and we don't need to have an SNA put on those properties to, to control their activities. I mean, those activities along, I mean, all those properties along the bottom of Hekramata Ranges are uneconomic units for, for farming. They're yes. too difficult to farm. They basically, if you clear them, they only grow gorse. And I don't think you need to actually, you need to get on board with the landowners and not just do something arbitrary and tell them what to do. They, if you come and have a talk with us and see what we're trying to do, just like what Doc has done with us over the years, you'll see that we're more accommodating than what you think. And it doesn't need to have an arbitrary approach to what is happening. Okay, thanks, Mr. Tate. Your, um, your point has been taken, thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? Oh, no, I don't have any questions, but thank you very much for taking the time to present to us. Mr. Marg? No, no actual questions, Mr. Tate, but thanks, like, like Jan said, thank you for taking the time to put up your summary this morning. Thank you. Mr. Cooney? As, as, a, as a general um, comment, Mr. Tate, um, the point you raised just now about that you'd come and talk, um, that, that, that approach has actually been discussed in a number of environment court cases. I know the one I was involved in uh, extensively, and and what you say is quite right. But sometimes the court has said, well, you know, the farmers are doing a good job, or the property owners are doing a good, really good job. But we need to bring in some regulatory control in case, in order to capture the renegade type landowner who just ignores you know the what you're doing so so that's sort of um, it's a debate that's that's been had before and it will continue to be a debate yeah i can see where you're coming from i know you know that thing but i mean when i look at the um with the with forests and thing like that with the oh i can't think of the name of it with the carbon credits and that type of thing there where where it was quite simple you know, for people to get value from the from the carbon credits, they had to put their properties within yeah. the system, and they all had to be mapped, and they had to the areas had to be determined. And then that was, I mean, in some ways that could be a similar process into the native bush. You know, if you want to protect the native bush, you could do it along like the carbon credit things, and they have some financial recompense for the owners yeah. that are looking after that bush. Mm. That's all I'm trying to say. I mean. If we're going to determine everything is done by the worst case scenario, it's not going to be a very good state for New Zealand, is it? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I have no questions, Mr. Tate. Um, thank you very much for your um, for your submission and the information you've provided to us today. You're welcome to stay and continue to listen or to go and uh, yeah, to do whatever else you feel you need to do. That's entirely up to you. No, I'm going to stay and listen. Yeah, very good. That's very good. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Uh, our next uh, submitter is uh, the Department of Conservation, please. Kia Can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Oh, perfect. Tēnā koutou, Ms. Ehrlich for the Director General of Conservation. I have with me Mr. Rydell, who you'll um, now be familiar with presenting planning evidence. And in another office, we have uh, Mr. Beecham, who is presenting evidence on Cody dieback, Ms. Thiele, who's presenting evidence on long tailed bats, and Dr. Corkery, uh, who is addressing offsetting. So, in terms of the, the legal submissions, there's really and just two points that the Director General wishes to highlight today, and those relate to Cody dieback uh, and 
the protection of long-tailed bat habitat. With respect to Cody dieback, the Director General's concern is that the proposed plan as notified or as amended does not contain adequate provisions or controls to appropriately manage Cody dieback. Part three of the legal submissions addresses Cody dieback. The Thames Coromandel District Council and Director General of Conservation um, case provides really helpful guidance on this matter. And I refer to this as the TCDC case going forward. So moving down to paragraph 3.6 of the legal submissions, this paragraph recites parts of sections 31A and 31B RMA. And these provisions are relevant to how Cody Dieback connects to the RMA, the role of the proposed plan and relevant mandatory council functions. For present purposes, the reference to contaminated land in section 31B is key. A sequence of definitions applies to the interpretation of the term contaminated land. Those definitions are set out at paragraph 3.7 of the legal submissions. TCDC considered Cody dieback in the context of council's functions and identified definitions and found that land that is within three times the drip line of Cody that is known to or may potentially contain the related pathogen as con contaminated land. Importantly, the court also considered that all Cody should be treated as contaminated until proven otherwise. Mr. <laughs> Beecham's evidence highlights that some challenges present in terms of confirming otherwise. For example, there is a lag period between infection and detection. There is a lack of sampling and nuances with the actual sites that are sampled or areas that are sampled. Per paras 3.8 C and D of the legal submission, TCDC also confirmed that district plan regulation of Cody dieback is not only desirable, it is necessary. The functions of a district council include maintaining indigenous biological diversity, which it is to achieve through integrated management of effects, including the adoption of controls to prevent or mitigate the effects of contaminated land or Cody dieback. The cited RMA provisions and TCDC decision highlight that controlling Cody dieback and maintaining Cody by establishing and implementing regulatory measures sits squarely within council's functions. These functions are not optional. The Director General says that the proposed approach to addressing Cody dieback is inconsistent with council's functions and the clear direction provided by TCDC. While he acknowledges the hearing report's comments regarding the complexities of establishing and implementing comprehensive Cody dieback controls, he says that complexities do not relieve the council of its function of controlling contaminated land, which in line with the TCDC's decision, includes land within three times the drip line that has not been proven to be free of the pathogen. So turning to long-tailed bats, and this is addressed in part four of the legal submission. Um, the hearing report recommends declining the Director General's submission, which seeks that the proposed plan is amended to include related mapping and provisions to achieve protection of, of their habitat uh, for want of spatial data. Though it notes that some rules relating to bat protection might be appropriate where mapping has occurred. Myths Thurley's evidence provides spatial data in the form of maps, per paragraph 4.4 of the legal submissions. To add to this, the Director General notes that Mr Turner might be well positioned to provide further data. His rebuttal evidence at 5.2 records that he has undertaken, and I quote, many years of monitoring and observing bats within the district. In paragraphs 4.5 and 4.6 of the legal submission, Ms. Seeley's evidence, sorry, in reference to Ms. Seeley's evidence, sets out key pressures uh, that relate to long-tailed bat communities. These pressures are congruent with those identified in Western Lee. Uh, there's actually an error in the reference there, so that 
is meant to refer to Winston Lee and the Director General of Conservation. Uh, in this case, the Environment Court observed that avoiding light and noise disturbance, providing for roosting, suitable roosting and improving the habitat quality of long-tailed bats are all critical if the species is to continue. Mr. Rydell's evidence sets out provisions that he considers to appropriately, appropriately recognise and provide for sustainable management with respect to long-tailed bats. The Director General acknowledges the gaps in data relating to bat habitat within the Waikato district. He says that Ms. Thurley and Mr. Rydell's evidence provides an adequate, appropriate and necessary starting point to implementing a framework that recognises and provides for the significant habitat of long-tailed bats in line with Section 6C. In terms of the role of the proposed plan, paragraph 4.11 of the legal submissions quotes two relatively strong observations from Western Lee regarding the deficiencies in the Waikato Regional, Regional Policy and Plan and in the Hamilton District Plan with respect to identifying the significant habitat of long-tailed bats. The court refers to the lack of identification of long-tailed bat habitat in the Waikato Regional Planning Instruments as an unfortunate lacuna, and the similar gap in the Hamilton District Plan as an unfortunate oversight and a matter requiring urgent redress. Identifying bat habitat is consistent with the King Salmon decision and that in the context of Section 6 CRMA, it would give increased particularity to both the substantive content and locality of the significant habitat of long-tailed bats. So to conclude, um, as set out in for, uh, for 12 to 13 of the legal submissions, and the Western Lee observations indicate that there is an expectation that <coughs> long-standing instruments will identify significant habitat. The Director General says that the proposed plan has a critical role in ensuring adequate protection of such habitat. Sustainable management requires safeguarding ecosystems essential for long-tailed bats and that their habitat is protected as a matter of national importance. And this might mean Council taking a proactive approach to obtaining and collating relevant data. So that concludes the legal submissions. Thank you, Ms. Ehrlich. Let's just see if there's any questions of you on, on those submissions. Mr. Marg? Uh, no, thank you. Ms. Gibb? No, thank you. Ms. Sedgwick? I'm very sorry, but no, it was very clear. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Mr. Cooney? No, I haven't got any. Thank you. No, and I've got no questions. If there's anything that arises out of the evidence in relation to those, we can always come back to you um, once we've heard from the witnesses who we'd like to hear from now, please. Thank you, sir. So if I can hand over to Mr. Beecham. Thanks, Mr. Beecham, just when you're ready. Uh, I hope you can you see us, we not. Yes. Uh, yes, we can see you. Okay, that's good, sorry. It was too difficult to tell from the scene. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Tony Beecham, I'm uh, um, been a, a member of the um, departments carried by Dybac team for the last 10 years. And my evidence today is um, has been placed into the SNA hearing, but it really could have been placed into any of any of, of a number of places because Cara Dybeck um, doesn't um, have any uh, zone um, priorities. Um, Cara Dybeck can be found in uh, urban, industrial, um, or natural areas. Um, the problem with Karadibak is that it's a organism which is invisible. Um, the hard-coated oospore that is um, generally being moved around by the movement of soil is actually formed within the roots of Kari and ends up in the soil after those small feeder roots rot. 
and um, the size of those uh, spores is um, 30 microns. So you can put a thousand of those spores on a pinhead. So we're talking about very, very small um, amounts of soil or that could uh, lead to uh, curry dieback. And the problem is when it actually infects a curry tree, um, it can remain invisible for very, very long periods of time uh, before symptomology is actually able to be, um, be observed, especially if you're relying on uh, things like um, planes um, to, uh, to find curry dieback because they're usually only finding uh, trees that have got substantial symptomology and have been contaminated if they're very large trees, sometimes for decades. The other problem with this is that um, if curry um, have been recently contaminated, they won't show any sign. And yet that material is still able to be moved uh, to form a new uh, area of infection. And the curry dieback can really be moved by any process that can move soil, including um, human um, activities, natural processes like landslides and slips. Um, some limited movement by uh, soil and, um, and literally any other anthropomorphic activity um, by humans or associated and uh, hoofed animals. We utilise um, the curry hygiene zone as three times the drip line, maximum drip line of any tree as a, as a management mechanism. Um, to really to indicate to people that um, this is the, um, the zone of interest around Kauri and uh, the pro a pro proportionary pro principle associated with, uh, with that zone. Um, in terms of, of how control should be put in place, um, well, that has been examined quite um, significantly in the uh, Thames Coromandel uh, case. Um, and we've covered a number of the areas, but the, one of the main areas um, that you, you will be aware of is that the government has just agreed to fund the National um, Pest Management Plan for curry dieback, and it's still relatively unclear exactly what that process is going to be. But there is um, already a, a set of 13 or 12 rules um, associated with managing dieback, and if those are implemented, then the earthworks rule, the, the, the area of principally of concern to the RMA process, um, as far as I'm concerned, is, um, is, is not um, able to cover all zones. The, the current proposal is for uncultivated areas, uh, not for all areas. Uh, the Waikato Regional Council um, also uh, has a process by which it's uh, using uh, management um, planning approach to approach landowners who have uh, contamination on their properties and to assist them in developing a, a curry dieback or its risk management plan, which is, will be a requirement of the, the national uh, program uh, should the rules as written come into effect. Um, however, in, in my opinion, because the, um, the rules in the national pest management plan do not cover zones like urban zones, um, there is still a substantial gap in the, uh, the regulatory or, or management plan approach to um, mitigating curry dieback on, on private and, and in some cases even um, other land that might be deemed um, to be quasi-public. Um, the Section 42 report refers to uh, voluntary actions. Um, the department went along the lines of voluntary actions of Thames Coromandel, but the Environment Court considered that just voluntary actions were not sufficient to um, put the brakes on curry dieback. And the Section 42 report refers to a document called Protecting Curry, a Rural Landowner's Guide. Um, I, I agree with the approach of the risk management approach and what's actually in that guide. However, the, the guide itself is deficient in, in terms of process. Um, and lacks provisions of uh, assigning responsibility and the sort of information flow that is required to, um, to go back to regional council. And, and, and it may, that, that gap may have been identified if the National Pest Management Plan uh, takes that up. But at the moment, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. Um, the guide that is referred to is actually an MPI document. It's not a regional council document. So 
if it was referred to within the, the current planning framework as the baseline document for management plans, it's actually open to change by, by other parties. It was actually written as part of the planning intelligence group of the, of the uh, previous um, um, joint program, which included regional councils, DOC and MPI, but that, that infrastructure that's formed that document is, a, is likely to change. And as mentioned um, earlier, um, the Environment Court decision is that um, Corridide Act needs to be addressed via the Biosecurity Act and RMA process, especially with regard to the regulation of earthworks and, 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 and activity that is going to contaminate. And that includes, in the case of three times the radius of the drip line, um, vegetation removal. So in summary, um, to stop the spread of chorodiabac, we need a precautionary approach because we actually can't identify the organism via uh, testing methods or visually until it's almost it's too late. Once the site is contaminated, it literally can't be decontaminated. And um, the processes that have, uh, that have been pursued um, at Thames and at the moment obviously are still not completed through the Environment Court are to um, enable a landowner to actually have a, a reasonable amount of control in terms of defining a management plan associated with Kauri on their property, um, but um, that process is a more visible process than uh, just a regulatory process for which there is no uh, reporting back to, um, to local uh, regional central government. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mr Beecham. I think what we might do is hear the rest of the evidence because I think some of the questions may well um, cross different different witnesses. So perhaps we can continue with your next witness, Ms. Ms. Ehrlich. That would be um, me, Tish uh, Gurley. I'm going to give evidence on long-tailed bats. Um, and I just want to emphasise a couple of things around their threat status and what they need in terms of habitat. Uh, so long-tailed bats are classed as threatened and they have the highest threat classification of nationally critical, which is the category which is most at risk of extinction. Um, they're projected to decline by more than 70% over the next three generations. Um, and this means that if nothing is done to restore populations of long-tailed bats, they're predicted to become extinct in the not too distant uh, future. The threats to bats include predation from predators, uh, rats, mustelids, cats and possums have all been implica implicated in declines. Other threats to bats include habitat loss through land clearance, habitat degradation through development and its associated effects such as um, lighting and noise and disturbance um, and habitat fragmentation through tree clearance and these threats are all really relevant to the bat populations in the urban and rural parts of the Waikato district. Uh, while there have been no studies of bat survival in the Waikato district there's no reason that I can see that where they're not protected, they're not on the same trajectory towards extinction as other populations for, for which we have data. In terms of habitat, bats need trees. Um, they need dark areas and they need areas free of disturbance. Um, in the urban and rural setting, these are limited and vegetation clearance is ongoing. And this makes bat populations in these areas very vulnerable uh, Long-tailed bats use trees for roosting, for foraging, for commuting, and, and they do this over a large landscape scale. Um, individual bats travel in kilometres between roosting and foraging sites, and different individuals are tending to spread themselves out spatially in the landscape. So when we think about bats, um, we have to think on that landscape scale. Roost trees used for breeding have very specific thermal requirements, so they're very rare in the environment, even in large forests. Um, a shortage of trees to roost in may well result in bats using suboptimal roosts, which can have lower survival rates. Um, because bats, at least in, house, in South Hamilton, use fewer roosts for a longer time compared to bats in forests, 
that's an indication that we're, uh, are in short supply uh, for this population at least. Trees are also used for foraging beside and over. Uh, they use vegetation such as hedges and trees to travel along, to move from roosting sites to foraging areas. And without these trees, the bat populations just can, cannot function. Uh, the loss of bats in the Waikato district would be significant on a national scale for such a threatened species. Um, conversely, um, having robust and thriving populations in the Waikato would also be of national significance for the persistence and, and recovery of the species. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Um, Let's press on and um, hear from the next witness, please, Ms. Ehrlich. Okay, kia ora koutou, and my name is Ilsa Korkri. So I've given detailed definitions of offsetting and biodiversity offsetting in, er, um, compensation in my evidence and summary of evidence. And I think most of my points um, have been addressed in the council's rebuttal, so I can keep this pretty brief. Um, Offsetting is an attempt to respond to the current declining state of biodiversity and the inherent assumption is that biodiversity offsetting can allow or can facilitate development on the basis that residual adverse impacts on biodiversity will be managed via an offset with the result of at least no net loss and preferably a net gain. Importantly, best practice offsetting is underpinned by an accepted set of principles and definitions. For example, you must follow the mitigation hierarchy, you must use explicit measurements, and there has to be a goal of bare minimum, no net loss. And this is really what differentiates offsetting from compensation. Compensation is typically a subjective approach and therefore carries a high risk for biodiversity values and so this is why compensation should always be the very last resort to address residual impacts. And lastly, it's really important to remember that there are limits to both what can be offset and limits to what can be compensated for. So for example, it might not be appropriate to accept an offset or to accept a compensation for values that are irreplaceable or for example, for a species that is very vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you very much, which I think means that we're up to Mr. Riddell. Thank you. Kia ora tato. Um, I do have a couple of typos, a couple more typos I've spotted in my evidence in chief. It's um, probably easiest for me just to email them in rather than let everybody try and that's, correct on screen. That's fine. We're, and I assume they're matters of detail rather than yeah. the substance of what but you're telling us, so that's fine. Things that like way. I've um, struck through a, a sentence that shouldn't have been. Okay, that's fine. Yep. Um, and I've also provided not just the summary, but also some supplementary evidence, which the supplementary evidence covers two, two groups of matters. One of them is that further reflection, having put in the evidence in chief and um, having a bit of time to expand on some of the areas where I said there should be a policy on to actually expand out and provide a sample policy in that uh, collated document. And the other one is just um, three comments about the um, rebuttal evidence from the council. That's fine. There's um, three, probably just three important issues that I think just I just need to just cover um, and leave the rest as you can read it. Um, the first one's just talking a bit about the significant natural areas mapping. Um, and the recommendation that there be a combined approach to mapping where mapped and unmapped sites are, are covered in the same uh, rules. Um, uh, the issue of um, the issue of a permitted activity certainty with a unmapped area, uh, you know, the certainty of a significant natural area. Um, being present or not being present and, 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 and putting it into a permitted activity rule is, is an issue that does need some thought. It can be difficult to do. Um, one of the ways of addressing that is to, as the, is to actually have a rule that sets um, vegetation clearance limits in the way I've set it out. There, are, there is another technique which is used in um, Whangarei, which is to define the 
areas of, you know, say any area of indigenous vegetation that's in excess of one hectare and where the vegetation is taller than six metres, we will assume is a, for the purposes of the consenting process is a significant natural area, but that requires quite a bit of background work. Um, and the other thing I just note about significant natural areas is that for threatened species and at-risk species, the habitat used by those species will include exotic vegetation. So when we're talking about significant natural areas, we're not just necessarily talking about that are um, identified in accordance with Appendix 2 of the plan. We're not just talking about exotic uh, indigenous vegetation necessarily. Particularly becomes a um, issue with when we get onto the long-tailed bats, which coincidentally is next. Um, the, so in the in the um, collated rules, I've, I've identified an area or referred to an area in policies and the rules are called a uh, bat protection area, which I would emphasise is a subset of significant natural areas. So it. Um, be, uh, because of criterion three, I think it is in, in appendix two. Um, so the significant natural areas would apply with an addition for the bat protection areas of consideration about the um, trees, exotic or indigenous, which are more than 15 centimetres in diameter. Um, and because this is, because bat protection, long tail bat protection is a very, uh, New area to you know for district plans to address and for uh, applicants to understand and decision makers to understand. Um, I, I'm proposing a policy um, in the collated summary 312BA, which sets out a whole lot of considerations in terms of the the um, protection of bats, and that's to guide decision makers and applicants. Um, the second part, and, and so that's, that covers the first part of the approach, which is the um, to, to bat protection within Waikato District, which is the um, bat protection area, which is a 7.3 kilometre circle around each, lo each, ident um, each location where a bat has been identified recently, um, last 10 years or so, I think it is. The second part of the approach is that quite a bit of the district either, you know, hasn't yet been adequately or properly surveyed for long-tailed bats. And the issue will arise where applications for subdivision or some other activity that requires a resource consent in those unsurveyed areas are made and it is discovered through the consenting process and the gathering of information that there's bat issues that need to be addressed. And the way that I'm suggesting that can be covered is just making sure that um, that for the restricted discretionary and controlled activities, a matter of control or discretion uh, relates to effects on long-tailed bats, and it would only kick in if there's the bats are in there. It's not an issue so much in terms of the um, discretionary or non-complying activities, obviously, because you can you can um, have any any issues addressed through that consenting process. And that would work in conjunction with the um, additional policy that's proposed. In terms of curry dieback, and probably to reinforce um, what Tony, Dr. Beecham said, um, I think there's the important and crucial propositions behind um, curry dieback are that you, you have to assume that all curry uh, root zones are contaminated. Um, and that's a, that reflects the cautious approach um, and also the delays in the onset of symptoms, the size of the pathogen and so forth. And the second one is that the main risk that can be managed in a district plan is the movement of soil, which is why the um, primary rule that's being proposed is one relating to earthworks with a secondary consideration in relation to vegetation clearance where the, within the curry root zone where the vegetation hits the ground and can get soil on it. Um, and as this is also a relatively new resource management issue, um, I have included a drafted policy to guide decision makers and applicants in the um, collated document. And that's all I need to say right now. 
Right, thanks, <laughs> Mr. Riddell. I just might just do a quick check with the panel about not, not what their questions are, but firstly, whether they have any and whether they there are one or two or a whole raft of them. And I'm only saying that because I think we might break for lunch. But I do want, before we do that, I do want to talk to the, depending on where we get to with the um, panel's number of questions, just want to briefly canvas um, things with Ms. Walker, Mr. Cameron and Ms. Wilcock, who are all due to have spoken this morning, but uh, look like won't. Um, and we'll need to come back after lunch. But let's just see, Ms. Cedric, have you got questions for the doc witnesses? And if so, uh, one or two or lots? You're on silent, Ms. Cedric. If only life was that simple. I have two and they're very brief. Okay. Um, Ms. Gibb? No, I have none, thank you. Mr. Mark? Oh, I have a few. Mr. What? Cooney? Um, I've got a, a, a couple, but they're not, not that long. Um, and I've only got a, probably a few as well. I think we might, in that case, I think we might, so that we don't inconvenience the doc witnesses who may want to do something else this afternoon, let's proceed with questioning and then we'll take a break for lunch. But can I just check before we do that? Um, firstly, Ms. Walker, um, you're okay to... Um, appear after lunch? So um, it's fine for me, Mr. Chair, but with respect, I, can we check with Bruce? I understood he um, did have to get away this afternoon. So, uh, so well, I was going to I was going to come to, to him next. Okay. Um, so Mr. Cameron, are you there? Yep, yeah, yeah. Got me now? Yes, I have, thanks. Yep, yep, okay, yeah, I, I do have to get away, but um, providing we're not too long. Um, well, I'd say we're gonna break for lunch. I would be pretty confident that we'd be breaking for lunch at one and we'd be back at 1.30. And we're happy yep. to take you first if that's um, okay with, with others. How yeah, would that no, work? I'll, yeah, no, I'll work in with Hillary first because they, okay. they go, no, that's fine. two of us All go right. hand in hand. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Wilcock? Yes, that's fine. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you very much. All right, let's let's proceed. Um, Ms. Sidgwick, could you ask your questions, please? Uh, thank you. I'm not sure if it is for um, Mr. Beecham or Mr. Riddell, but <clears throat> I'm interested to know uh, of um, curry in urban areas, um, and presumably that is one or two trees or one tree. Would the would it, in your opinion, would the earthworks rule capture any any gardening works around the tree that may contribute to the removal of um, soil to other places. I'm just interested in that, just that aspect. Um, the proposal for a management plan um, around gardening and uh, fence posts and cultivation are part of um, the considerations that are taking place under the 293 process in terms of Coromandel. Um, the, the issue of current dieback, of course, can obviously be spread on an on a urban property as much as a, as a rural property. And the use of management planning and or, and or hygiene will not necessarily restrict uh, gardening or a fixed post placement under, in, in an area, but will potentially restrict how you move soil around those processes and where you leave material um, within, within a, a management zone. But because in, when you're in an urban area, you, the three times the drip line of recovery might include obviously a building or some piece of um, uh, uh, driveway or something along those lines, but all of the management, using a management plan approach, you can obviously just confine that activity to uh, the areas where obviously curry which is likely to be present rather than where it's likely to be absent. Um, I, I would just add that um, the policy on curry dieback does emphasise the benefits with gardening in an urban setting of of um, using handheld or easy to clean tools so that you can clean the tools before you go into a curry root zone and clean them as they come out again. 
Um, and it's much easier to do it if it's, for example, a spade and a than it if you go in with a digger or something like that. So that's that one. The second thing is a subtlety of the um, national planning standards definition of earthworks is that it excludes gardening, fence posts and cultivation. And you'll notice in my evidence, I say that um, if you're going to use that definition, then you need to be saying that excludes, except you need to put in the exception, you know, make sure that the exception in relation to gardening, um, digging holes for fence posts and cultivation doesn't apply when you're considering kauri dieback. Otherwise, yeah. we just yeah. got to I, I think that was the point that, that alerted me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Sedgwick. Mr. Mark? Yeah, just a couple. Um, thank you, Mr. Beecham, in relationship to your evidence. I think I'm a lot more knowledgeable on kauri dieback than I ever was before. Just in saying that though, you, you've stated that there's no known sites within the district at present, but could be. But most of the trees identified are only in the dock estate. Is that correct? No, I didn't state that, um, that most of the known trees are in the dock estate. That was in Mr. Turner's rebuttal evidence. Okay. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, and, and, and I agree with another statement of Mr. Turner's rebuttal evidence, and that's it's kauri that's been planted in, in all sorts of areas throughout the, uh, throughout the district. So I expect kauri to be represent, be present in all zones, rural, uh, conservation estate, urban, uh, maybe even in, if they've been planted along the roadside in the industrial area. I, the, well, we've got, we've got kauri virtually, I suspect, in every zone. Kapai, thank you for that. And the approach that you're suggesting is precautionary and therefore looking at preventative methods and controls going forward, I guess no different to what the Regional Council has tried to or are attempting to have done already. But if we're thinking about, uh, I think it was 6.6 .6 of your evidence whereby you stated that it's, there's some evidence around feral pigs uh, easily transmitting or potentially transmitting from a vector perspective, Cody Dieback, how would we control that going forward? Um, that's starting to be addressed um, via um, the department with Tangata Whenua groups in Northland on uh, some of our even bigger forests, where we're, we're trying to address the uh, relationship between kauri and feral pigs, and, um, and, and looking for practical measures by which we can start actually controlling pigs. Um, and in Waipa, we've been doing some work also with Tom Defender on feral pig control. Um, but the main issue being actually understanding why, where the pigs are and when and where to hunt them and, and, and how to reduce their population numbers and impacts. But any feral animal, um, pigs, goats, or anything else, um, to, to really get completely on top of kauri dieback in natural areas, the, the populations have got to be reduced to very, very low numbers. Um, so there are, there are other forests, um, and we've got one major forest in, in Northland that we know of kauri dieback only being in a very, very small area. And it may be practical in that case to actually do things like fencing rather than actual look, looking at feral animal control over those very, very small sites. Um, so there are a series of measures, but I acknowledge fully that there is a problem with feral animals, and, I don't, and, and pigs is, is one of them, but I, I'd say any hoofed animal um, it is, is a problem. Oh boy, thanks for that. Uh, no other questions. Thanks, Mr. Mag. Mr. Kearney. Mr. Bochat, my on the topic, um, the uh, currently dieback is a national and regional issue, isn't it? it it's national plus regional in that it applies to the whole of the Waikato area. Yes, it is national and regional, yes, absolutely. And as I say, all zones, all councils, all... all but yeah, it's also a uh, landowner issue because it's not just um, on, on public land, it's, it's um, potentially going to be spread throughout private land. And that's very evident in the area between, say, Whangarei and Auckland, where there's still significant curry on private land, which is contaminated. So um, you mentioned in paragraph 12 of your summary statement that uh, I think, uh, I don't know what it means, but you said that um, 
a, na a proposed national pest management plan with 12 rules that's been submitted twice to government but is, it, is currently unfunded. What does that mean? Nothing's been done at the regional level, does it? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Um, the, the way of dealing with regulation was to actually to leave regulation at the regional and local level or to actually move to a national pest management plan. And NBI had decided that they were going to go for a, a national pest management plan and all the consultation under the law has been carried out two years ago. And it's only in the last two weeks that the new Labour government has indicated that it's one, it will, it will fund the agency and the agency is obviously going to um, end up with that national plan and set of rules to re-examine in relation to the funding that our central government is providing, which I understand is about 32 million over five years. So we can expect shortly some direction. Can councils expect some direction on this from a na at a national level? I would expect so, Sue. So yes, I can't guarantee that, obviously, but I certainly would expect that. Okay. Um, and then moving down, did, what is the regional council doing about uh, helping out? The regional council has. Um, got uh, some indication in its regional pest management plan that it will support um, landowners where curry dieback is actually detected on their property to, to develop a management plan. But of course that detection is generally of um, high, uh, symptomatic trees which have been contaminated for quite a long time. Um, and so that the, the way that they've been finding that trees is the aerial surveys you were hearing uh, uh, the council talk about earlier on with fixed planes and uh, using LIDAR. And probably in future, the, the agency will move to uh, multi-spectral analysis. Uh, all the research is, is being completed on, on the use of that technology. The problem so with the, the, the current dieback is that it's canopy based at the moment. So at the moment, they're, they're taking a non-regulatory approach? Um, I'd say that the, the, they have, it's, it's, at the moment, the plan is relatively silent on Karadivak, the, the Waikato regional plan. There is, there is one rule about Karadivak and their regional pest management strategies, but that um, is up on the side of the who knows. Okay. So, so yeah okay so uh now now you're coming at the district level and and you the doc wants to impose a regulatory regime on on property owners within the district that's uh, where we finished up where we finished up is that we are trying to cover all zones where kauri is likely to be present and the current and proposed national approach has been to actually look at uncultivated land rather than cultivated land. And the Environment Court has indicated that to actually adequately deal with curry dieback, including the principal mechanisms for movement as earthworks, um, that, that the that curry dieback needs to be dealt with via the biosecurity and using the Biosecurity Act under MPI or this new agency. And and by um, regional and district government in terms of control of, of processes associated with earthquakes. And uh, <clears throat> so we've got a situation here where the, the what's proposed in, in this plan, the Waikato uh, district plan, is, is not simply walking away from it, is it? We've got some provision there to deal with Kauri dieback. It seems what, what you're saying is we need to be do better than that. Yeah, the, uh, the issue simply is because of the uh, literally invisible nature of Karadiabak at the time it is actually infecting something, and because of the, the inability of us to actually detect it easily, um, utilising um, uh, other mechanisms, and, and they're relatively expensive at the moment as well. Um, we need to follow a precautionary principle in terms of, of hygiene and cleanliness of, of uh, equipment and personnel um, around covering. 
Yes, so we've really been asked to say, uh, take a holding position until the national standards or whatever national direction comes out. That, that, that's sort of a, a consequence, isn't it? Uh, yes, um, as I say, I have no idea what whether the new agency is going to change the proposed rules that they that was was taken to to, to the central government. And um, just the application of what you proposed, um, if if a, if a property owner, for example, a farm owner, has a few kauri trees uh, in the city on a paddock, then then and, and nothing else, sort of thing, then they can't, don't have to, to do any, any work around those trees that have to do, get a consent. Is that, I'm talking in, I'm very, being very general here, but that, that's the sort of general application of it at, at that level. Um, yeah, depending on what they're wanting to do, obviously, if they're wanting to fence it off at three times the drip line or more, they would be, um, undertaking a preventative activity. If they were wanting to dig a drain, yes, they would be, be, be talking about um, pre uh, preparing a management plan so that they would, that the material that they were actually moving around those trees wasn't spread further. Yeah, okay. And just, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Thurley, um, the bat protection area, um, the areas that you have identified, would, how, how reliable are those areas that you say have been identified in the Waikato? Um, it's based on records of bat activity from 1990 to, to today, and that's the best information that we've got at the moment. So they're reliably there. Um, what we're missing is, is knowing um, is knowing that they're not, well, no, it's knowing, in areas where we haven't surveyed, we don't know where they are, so they're going to be in more places than are shown. So is, is DOC uh, taking it upon themselves to go and look at these areas and try and identify where the areas are? Are they going to do the work to do that? Uh, Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that's part, not part of our role, I don't think. But you think it's the role of the District Council to do that, do you? Yeah, Troy might be able to help me out there. So I have partially addressed this in the legal submissions. Uh, as the Director General sees it, there's two kind of separate roles. <laughs> Yeah, there's the role of the department in managing or protecting wildlife itself under the Wildlife Act. And then there's the district council's role, uh, which is tied into the protection of the significant habitat uh, for those bats. So while it's to a degree connected, there is some distinction between the roles. The point I'm point I'm making is that the evidence we're being given is pretty pretty general and doesn't seem to me to be very reliable as to the identi identification of the bat areas per se. It needs a bit more a bit more input, and so so how are we going to deal with that if that's the case? I think I think my point is that um, this bat is a, it's an incredibly threatened species. We've got some data on it um, from records which have been collected from 1990, and we have to do something about it. This is, this is the best information that we've got. It covers a significant area, though, doesn't it? Seven and a half kilometres for every place that you, you, you believe there may be bats. Yeah, further survey might, um, well, it would expand in some areas and contract a bit in, in other areas. Um, but bats, as I said, they do work on a landscape scale, so it is looking at large areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, can I just follow up, Miss Turley? There was actually no numbers quantifiable, quantifiably done around. I think it's appendix three or four, your map that you've got that shows the range that they'll fly 
from Hamilton City all the way up to Raglan is virtually a brown, lots of whole lot of brown rigs. But there's no actual number of bats apart from the 24 that was done in the survey that were followed. Is that correct? Um, how those surveys were done is using uh, bat recorders. So you leave the recorders out and they record bat activity. Um, so they record, they pick up the frequencies that the bats echolocate at. So it's just looking at bat activity, um, not at numbers. Yes, that's right. There's no numbers. Mm. Apart from the 24 that were, I guess, followed in one of those surveys. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So there's been a couple of surveys where um, the researchers have put transmitters on bats and then tracked them to see where they move during the night. Um, and those are those that, that you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. But bottom line for the district, there is no quantifiable number of long-tail bats available at this point in time. Uh, the only number that we've got is from those South Hamilton, um, that South Hamilton study where there's a minimum of 61 bats. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I just have uh, two questions. Uh, first one relates to Cody Dieback. What does the draft NPS say about Kari Dieback specifically, if anything? What, what draft NPS is this? Week? Sorry, the draft NPS on biodiversity. To be quite honest, I haven't looked at the draft NPS on bio, Indigenous biodiversity because I think it's about the third or fourth one that's kicked around in my time. Okay, and same question, but in relation to bat protection specifically, as opposed to biodiversity specifically, does the in, is are any of the doc witnesses able to enlighten us as to what the NPS biodiversity in its latest draft says about bat protection? No, sorry, I'm not able to. I'm sorry. All right. All right, well, we can, we can find that out for ourselves, but thank you very much, and I have no further questions. Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen, for your, uh, for your evidence today. We'll... Um... Oh, sorry, just can I just add a little bit? The draft, looking at it now on the screen, the draft national policy statement has something about highly mobile fauna. Yeah, but I, my question was, what does it say about bats specifically? Yeah. I, they, they, I, I presume bats might be highly mobile fauna. Kauri obviously, obviously wouldn't also be. Also mobile. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll take that. Um, we'll have a look at that ourselves, but thank you. All right, I think we'll, um, we'll adjourn for lunch. Thank you for your evidence and contribution today. Uh, rather than 1.30, we'll take another five extra minutes. I'm sure you'll be able to cope with that, Mr. Cameron. We'll adjourn until um, one. 35. We'll hear you first, then Ms. Walker, and then Ms. Ms. Wilcock, and then we'll proceed with the um, rest of the schedule for the afternoon. Thank you. Uh, and we can we'll we'll need to re-log on on the new meeting request for this afternoon.